Some of this data, I know Richard and uh, uh, Darius will hit on some of this later, so I'm going to skip through some of this quickly, but just for context, you know, here's some of the things that we're seeing on the ground in economic development. Um, you know, high, uh, high employment change, we are, we are, our jobs are growing, our unemployment rate is low, um, employment, and you can see how we compare to uh, national and uh, Maryland standards, Howard County is the blue line here, so those are good trends that we're enjoying. Um, resident employment growth, this is the uh, number of residents in the county with jobs continues to uh, continues to grow and exceeding uh, national and state uh, uh, trends as well. So more of our residents are getting jobs. The unemployment rate continues to be low compared to the others as you see. Here's uh, something you may not see in other places. The commercial real estate, this is a, uh, a metric that we track in terms of vacancy rates and uh, uh, rental prices. This is across, uh, this is for office, yeah, this is for uh, all commercial space. So office, industrial, flex spaces. Um, our vacancy rate continues to, you know, uh, trend in a positive direction. Even with all the construction that you've been seeing, vacancy rate isn't really spiking all that much. And rents continue to go up. So those are two good indicators that our, uh, that our market is, is, is healthy. And here is uh, specifically as it relates to the uh, to the office uh, to the office market, um, a little bit of uh, spike in the uh, vacancy right here. But of course, you know you see a lot of office construction happening downtown, but rental rates are going up. You know, typically average. You know, if, if you are below 10 percent, that is a healthy uh, that is a healthy metric. It means you have uh, inventory to sell. You, know, you almost don't want a vacancy rate that's too small because you don't have enough product on the shelf to sell. We'll get into that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, some of our employment sectors, and I know the uh, the other guys are going to get into this, but you know, we use this in our uh, in our marketing in terms of the, our workforce is you know largely skewed toward professional, uh, scientific, healthcare, administrative support as it relates to uh, the the state average. The blue the blue bar here is Howard County. Uh, Maryland is the, uh, the orange bar. You can see how we, our workforce is heavily skewed towards uh, the highly educated uh, workforce sectors. This is a chart of the 10-year growth rate of the, uh, of the various uh, employment sectors and current Howard County employment. So you can see how we are, we are trending strongly as it relates to the various Professional business services, trade, transportation, utilities, education, health, leisure, hospitality, these are the growth rate of these industry sectors and our current employment in those sectors. Uh, industry outlooks, our employment uh, compared to the projected growth rates in those various, in those various sectors. So, for example, you know the uh, projected growth rate of professional business services is projected to grow by 20,000. We already have quite a bit of employment in that in that sector, and that's how that that chart trends. So, you folks are familiar with these kinds of accolades and achievements: best place to live, safest place in America, healthiest. These are all great accolades that we use in our marketing. 
Um, one of the things I want to point out in, uh, in this one is as we look at uh, our, our workforce, you know, we have uh, some of the highest median income, but we are nine times the average uh, national average in a portion of R&D jobs, four times the national average in computer science jobs. Those are very uh, strong indicators of our, of our workforce and why we see the growth rates that we do in certain industries because we do have that kind of workforce, workforce here. more of the accolades that we enjoy because of the county that we have. And the reason I put these in here is because these are, these are you know, great advantages for us, but it's also um, you know, a, a bit of a cautionary tale. It's, uh, we've had a lot of investment and a lot of ability to position the county to achieve you know, these kinds of rankings. Um, It helps us attract the workforce, it helps us attract the companies, but we have to make sure what are we doing to help maintain this, this education, these, these amenities that we enjoy, the community college, the recreational facilities that we have. I'll come back to that point in a bit. Just to give you some context on uh, the work that we do, uh, we, had a, we have a strategic plan. We, uh, it was a 2017 effort, it began in 2018. The strategic plan outlined uh, eight, uh, eight areas. It was a situational analysis. So here, here's the context. Here's the world that we're living in right now. And these drove our, our five uh, strategic, uh, strategic plan initiatives. And I put these up here uh, just to remind you, or if you're new to the group, just to tell you, you know, what the situation analysis was and why we're pointed in the direction that we are. And I'll get to that. Um, I'm going to run through them very quickly. Um, unique strengths and uh, real threats. Basically, I said, you know, Howard County is positioned very well with the workforce and the quality of life. However, there are, you know, uh, certain threats uh, that we need to consider about that. And uh, I'll speak to those threats uh, in a bit. Disruption in economic development spoke to the, uh, the conception that, you know, economic development is not about business attraction quite so much as you might think it is. It's about uh, working with your existing businesses and business retention and growing your own. Uh, middle market being the sweet spot, uh, speaking to uh, small businesses is where you need to focus your attention because that's where you, your job growth will come from, specifically you know, in the 10 employee to 30 employee uh, area. Essentially, companies with less than 50 employees will be where you see most of your job growth. Those are the companies that you can help scale more quickly and create the jobs. It also pointed out that we lacked a place uh, that was conducive to innovation. Uh, it spoke to uh, urban cores and uh, as magnets for talent attraction, so that was, a, that was a, a bit of a threat. It spoke to our transit connectivity as a, as a weakness. It told us to think globally as, as an imperative, so uh, the, uh, the market you need to be helping your companies uh, look globally, and you need to reach globally uh, to help attract uh, attention to your market. And they talked about uh, uh, unequal benefits from job growth, so not only focusing on a high end technical jobs, but the full spectrum of, uh, of skill sets and, and wage rates and uh, industry sectors so that you can uh, help the entire county grow across the spectrum. So those eight, uh, eight uh, pieces of information basically distilled down into five strategies that uh, we are currently working with. Uh, we lead with robust business retention and expansion. That basically means we spend most of our effort fo uh, focused on our existing businesses, helping them uh, stay here and grow here. Um, it said to unleash the power of innovation. Basically become a center of innovation where you use innovation to help your existing businesses grow and also you help uh, new businesses start to organically grow your, your economy. It told us to prioritize research and messaging, which basically says, you know, understand your market, understand yourself, and broadcast that message uh, so that, you know, you're, you're marketing yourself uh, smartly. And if you do those three things well, 
your attraction efforts become much easier and you can leverage those things as an attraction, as an attraction tool. It also spoke about resources for uh, special projects like um, floods and building explosions and things of the like. So, uh, because we get involved in a lot of, a lot of that kind of work. So, what is all of uh, the the work that we've done as it relates to those strategies over the past over the past four years? We have worked on almost 200 projects that have committed 5,100 new jobs to the to the county has retained. 4,800 jobs, capital investment of 220 million, and those, uh, and then square footage of almost 4 million square feet. Those metrics we track closely because that really is what drives, you know, the, the, the tax base. New jobs, capital investment, the more capital investment a company makes, the more uh, sticky it becomes, the more invested it is in the community, and square footage. I mean, that's about, uh, you know, the building absorption and you know, causing new buildings, the more uh, square footage we can impact, the more demand there is for more buildings, which drives our tax base. Hey Larry, can yeah. I just ask you on that? Um, for those who just may not know, how did you define a project? A, a project is an opportunity that comes that comes to us or that we've cultivated that results in, you know, an expansion of some sort. Is most of that growth in the Columbia downtown redevelopment or spread around the county as far as the capital? It's around, everywhere. Maple Lawn, Route 1, downtown Columbia Gateway, primarily. Um, this is just a four-year comparison across those, uh, across those measures. Uh, new jobs in the blue, uh, retained jobs in the, uh, in the red. You know, generally speaking, you know, somewhere between, you know, uh, 1,000 to, to 1,400 uh, you know, new jobs uh, a year. Here's a uh, square footage impacted. You know, some years we have boomer projects like in, uh, in, in uh, FY16, you know, a 300,000 square foot uh, you know, warehouse or manufacturing facility will really throw your numbers. But generally somewhere between 800 and, uh, and a million square feet tends to be our, uh, our average capital investment. Uh, you see how it can trend across, across the year. So, you know, positive trends in terms of these measures. Uh, technical assistance is just another measure that we track, and these are uh, things that we do day to day that help a company. We help them with a permit, we help them uh, find financing, we help them find a customer, we help them find a vendor. These are, uh, you know, it's, it's a great deal of work that the team does, uh, which may or may not result in, you know, a new job or new square footage or a new capital investment, but it does become part of your fabric and your business climate as you're helping your local businesses. Um, some of you have seen this before. This is just the business size distribution. Um, you know, 80, 80 some percent of our companies have fewer than 20 employees. And this speaks to that middle market being our sweet spot. We focus most of our efforts and most of our, you know, clients tend to be, you know, in the, in the smaller, uh, the smaller businesses. Only 3% of our companies have more than 100 employees. Here's our top industry sectors as it relates to those projects that we were, we were talking about. Cyber information technology, manufacturing, retail, healthcare, ag, food services, finance. These are just the top, the top eight. Uh, yeah, right? Uh, just a, you know, a little bit of a, of a visual on the types of companies that, uh, you know, that have that, you know, expanded here lately. And the reason I put this up here is just to give you an idea of the spectrum of projects that we're dealing with. It's, uh, you know, uh, food, uh, food manufacturing, J.J. McDonald, it's cybersecurity. It is uh, small technology companies that grow out of our incubator. Um, it is uh, healthcare. It is biotech. It is a you know just a variety. Intralytics just bought a building in Gateway, you know, and just opened this this, this past year, for example. Uh, so those projects that we work on, basically the county, my county budget is you know plus or minus two and a half million dollars. My entire budget is about three and a half million dollars. The rest of that, uh, the balance of that money we receive through you know our private investment and uh, you know sponsorship, membership, and uh, uh, private investment. But for every dollar that the county invests in EDA, it translates into seven dollars and fifty-nine cents uh, back in uh, back in revenue. 
so those jobs, that uh, capital investment, and that you know square footage real estate uh, uh, assessment returns back to the county seven dollars and fifty nine cents. You have any questions on that study, Dr. Clinch? Is it <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the commercial base for a uh, for a quick moment. Um, this is the commercial the commercial tax base, you know, historically going back to 1993, just to give you a sense of the. Of, you know where it was, you know, 20 plus years ago, to where it is, to where it is today. In recent years, uh, 2015 to 2019, you can see how this is the, just the commercial portion of the of the tax base, how it has how it has grown. We had a pretty good uh, pretty good uh, year last year between 2018 and 2019, uh, as it relates to the marginal the marginal difference. Looking at it as it relates to the uh, residential tax base. So our orange bar here is the uh, commercial portion of the tax base. The, uh, the red, uh, blue bar is the residential. Blue bar is residential, orange bar is commercial. And the proportion of commercial to, to residential. Yeah. This is, yeah, I'm sorry, this is the, the, the real estate property tax. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, last year was uh, you know was a, was a pretty decent year. Um, there was a lot of a lot of new construction, a lot of new things hit the you know real estate assessment numbers, and we are about 18.1 percent of uh, of the total assessment. So you know my job is to make that orange bar be more of that entire stack. We're trying to increase the, the taxable uh, commercial commercial base. This is a little bit of a dense slide. I'm going to walk you through it because what does that mean? How do you increase that commercial base? How do you impact, how do you impact that number more? And this, this is just sort of a little bit of a case study to give you a sense of what it means to grow that accessible base. So our entire base for 2019 was 51 billion dollars. The commercial portion of that was nine, so that's where we come up with our 18.1 percent, right? If we were trying to get to 19 percent, we would need nine billion dollars more of, of accessible base, which uh, you know we'd have to get to nine billion dollars of accessible base, which is about half a billion dollars more. So what does that mean in like real terms? If you are familiar with the MedStar building downtown, right? We know that, that is, the assessment on that building was about $50 million. So basically to get to this number, to try and go up you know, one more percent, I need nine more MedStar buildings. So just to give you a sense of what does it mean to go up uh, or to increase that tax base one percent. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it kind of puts it in puts it in real terms. How do we stand uh, as it relates to taxable base uh, compared to some of our our peer jurisdictions or nearby <coughs> nearby counties? Uh, you can see, you know, Baltimore City is at thirty percent. Cecil Frederick, you know, is close to close to twenty. We're at eighteen point one percent. In terms of total commercial base, though, um, compared to some of our peer counties, um, you know, we are at nine billion. Baltimore City at thirteen billion. And you know, can kind of see how we rank compared to our peer counties. Larry, before you go forward, yeah, is there a correlation between that uh, proportion of commercial base and the population density? Wow! Wow! Um, here it goes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is the work of Mr. Zach Jones there to try and put it into. Uh, I think uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and that's why we kind of put this up here. This, you know, just you know, what does it mean in terms of in terms of per capita? So this is, you know, the the answer to that question. What are, what are the obstacles to increasing it? Is it land? Or? Yeah. Well, that's one. Of, that's one of them, actually. I've got um, I've got several projects right now that I'm either at risk of losing companies or can't find a home for somebody that wants to be here. And um, if I had 30 acres, 
I would have a 500 job, six building campus of research and development uh, of a national company with a name you would recognize. You know, I mean that's we we just talked about how many MedStar buildings does it take, right? This company wants to be in Howard County so bad. I don't have 30 flat acres to, to give. We're working on a couple of you know things, but. I have a handful of, of existing companies right now that are trying to expand, and I either don't have I don't have the products to give them. And yeah, land availability is is I would say one of the top challenges. Yeah. Yes, sir. And APL is not included, so they don't pay property tax. Sure. So it's also depending on the biggest private sector employer doesn't pay. Excellent point. Yeah. Wait, would you also? What is the implication of uh, Long Reach not being on our tax base? Um, I could look it up for you, um, <laughs> but it, I mean uh, that's eight acres inside of Columbia that used to be on the tax rolls. It's right. no longer. Yeah, I don't know what the number is, but. I, I, I think that, that would be an interesting thing for the No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, <coughs> the Flyer building downtown, that's a you know, 30,000 square foot building, mm -hmm. two, two acres that you know, could be. My other question is, of the um, top employers that are the 100 plus, mm -hmm. are the majority of those public institutions like the hospital, the college, or do we actually need WR Grace, I'm sure, is these I mean, there's some implications in terms of the income tax level, I think, if you look at those two also. Uh, I, would, I mean, I would say it, it, there's a mix. There's, there's certainly a healthy mix, but, you know, uh, you know Verizon, um, you know, APL is a large, a large so employer. So maybe 50 uh, WR Grace, uh, Coastal Sunbelt. I mean, yeah, there, there's a healthy mix okay. of, you know, both private and, you know, some, some public sectors. But, you know, those, you know, I mean, So, kind of to that uh, question, now, I know, I think Leonardo's going to talk a little bit later in the, in the program about, uh, about some of this, but, you know, one of the challenges is about, you know, land availability, absolutely. Uh, some of the other challenges, and, you know, just sort of foreshadowing, my concern is legislation that, you know, either passes or doesn't pass, but the impact that it has either directly or reputationally is a, is a concern. Uh, this was uh, APFO. Uh, you, you guys know this, the, this, the you know, the, this, this body commissioned a study. Uh, we did a study prior to that, but, uh, you, know, APF, you know, APFO tells us that there's $63 million of lost revenue to the county in the first six years. There was about, you know, somewhere between five to 8,000 foregone jobs as a result of APFO, potentially. So, um, that's something to something to think about um, in terms of you know actual actual jobs that were pulled on it whether it relates to construction or residential income of jobs that may not be here other pieces of legislation that you know uh, uh, caught our attention frankly uh, CB 38 uh, from last year would have impacted 200 acres of commercial land in the <coughs> one fork um, it was, you know, it covered a, a much greater area because it was, you know, including residential area in tactical watershed. But that legislation impacted 200 commercial acres along Route 1 that would have impacted 2,000 jobs, potentially. Uh, CB42, the impact fee, this 500% increase on uh, commercial development. And I know Leonardo's going to talk about this. Um, you know, that when you're when you're a developer and you have choices about where you can do things, those things, you know, threaten it threatens me and scares scares them. Uh, HB 19 is the second test. Uh, the commercial construction excise tax it's pending. Those types of things, uh, just from a, uh, a reputation standpoint, Howard County. One of Howard County's greatest strengths, and I've done work in other counties across the state. One of Howard County's greatest strengths has always been it's friendly and predictable and uh, responsive to, to business. And that and you're seeing the results of all that. All of those achievements that I put up here and all that job growth, that has been our stock and trade. And I'm concerned that some of this stuff is going to uh, kill the golden goose, frankly. So we have to be careful about that. Whether I'm not debating 
the merits of the legislation or not. I'm telling you what the impact of some of these things are to the market and to the folks that actually contribute to the commercial tax base and creating jobs. You can debate the issue all you want, but the implications are. So. And just to add something on the legislation, just so there's also right now that would be under local legislation that at least has been introduced. I'm not sure exactly where it is and if it will go through, but oh, state. State. Oh, it's, it's it's state, but it's it's, it's local. It's by our general yeah. assembly yeah. delegation. Yeah. And so and so when you talk about Apple, there's <coughs> another piece that's even being talked about where even though you may have been you may have gone through and passed the test as it relates to your roads to te the APFO test, but then it could basically say that if by the time you get ready to ultimately break ground and what have you, that you could, your development could actually be stopped if that school where you may have originally passed the test is now over the percentage of um, uh, if, if ultimately if you don't meet the, if you don't pass it at that moment. So as I you know I understand it, maybe Jeff could even. Uh, corroborate this or what have you, but from, as I understand, it's basically three years typically that it may take by the time you start your process to when you actually <coughs> start to break ground and develop between just your approvals, permits, everything else. So the other piece from a predictability standpoint, you started spending money based upon an assumption that, hey, I've passed my tests, I've gone through, only to get down the road to be told, I know you originally passed it, but the school, you know, these things have changed. Yeah, I know you've spent money and everything else, but you can't move forward. Yeah. That's just another, again, not getting into the whether you agree, disagree, what have you. But I think, as Larry touched on it, from a predictability um, business perspective, that would just be something else that makes it much more difficult to ultimately make decisions from a business standpoint yeah knowing that I think I'm good only to get down the road to be told, no, you're not. I mean, you know, for, for this group, as you are trying to solve the problems that are before you in terms of spending affordability and, you know, setting priorities on spending and, you know, uh, that you even have to cut costs or raise revenue and if you're looking to the commercial base as part of that solution to help, you know, raise revenue, I'm telling you that some of those things are going to be hurdles that to be overcome, because it's not going to help you get to increase your tax base. That's the reality of it. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, I wonder if you were able to uh, explain, um, APFO passed in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, even as uh, three years before that, the county executive at that time said that the county was facing a deficit, about a $14 million deficit at that time. Um, that was in the climate of the unrestrained, uh, you know, low mitigation in terms of growth and, you know, the low impact fees uh, that started as far back as 2004 and no impact fees before that. So how does that reconcile, you know, the fact that there was, you know, fiscal problems even before APFO was considered reconcile with the fact, you know, that was the climate that we are, that we were in and for all intents and purposes, that's what the, that's the climate now because we haven't seen it take effect yet. Mm -hmm. So how does that reconcile with, with you know, we, the financial, the fiscal pro problems were even before that, right? So how, how, how does that reconcile with that? I would answer it like this, you know, we saw, you know, we saw job growth, we saw square feet uh, positively trend, we saw capital investment positively trend, and, you know, the market was, you know, coming to Howard County because it was a great place to do business, right? My concern is those things might now start to trend the other way. It already started before, right? It started even as far as early as 2015. Mm -hmm. So. I'm on the revenue side of the of the uh, of the ledger. Um, I'm not going to talk about the expense side of the ledger because that's these guys. You know, you can you can talk about where the budget was or how it was. I'm I'm telling you, you know, business on the 
attraction, you know, development, growth, job creation side of things, trending positively. I think later, to answer a question later, that actually in the DBZ's presentation about the county's demographic change and of economic development there, there's a couple of slides. Um, Apple, maybe you can use that time to talk a little more on that. But the overall fiscal picture, which is has been have a structuring imbalance between revenue expenditure, regardless the um, whether there is new legislation or not really well to the new development. The problem is that with based on Apple study, that's going to get more severe because based on the consultant study, there will be net impact, which is a net loss to the county. So Apple itself, as an ordinance, we're not talking about amendment, just ordinance, there's nothing wrong about having a test to control and make sure the new development is in a manageable way. I think what Larry was talking about is predictability in terms of policy change and also the scope in terms of the percent I think you mentioned 500 percent. You know, again, there is a benefit and um, cost to that. There is just a, I mean, it's just not for discussion purpose. Again, he's not saying it's not bad policy. He just say there's impact and people need to prepare for that. You know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not debating the, not the, the, the pros and cons of it. That. I'm telling you how the market perceives it because, exactly how the market perceives it because other places may now be more, you know. I, could, I can actually give you an example. I sit on a board down in Anne Arundel County for a construction business. And I said something about what are you doing for business development in Howard County? And they said, it's totally on hold. We're working in other counties that are, you know, and they, totally get on the adequate facilities um, and they will not do business development here now. It's yeah. just not lucrative for them. Yeah. And Keith, I didn't even put up here some of the ag headwinds that you're facing. Don't even go you know, there. But, you know, <laughs> right, right, right here. I mean, that's another we'll industry sector that is facing its own yeah. legislative challenge. Yes, ma'am. I think what we, have to, what we have to keep in mind is part of the challenge is what attracts people to Howard County or the schools. <coughs> Apco, fine, it's a test. But the challenge that we have on the school system side is fine if you wait and you pause is lovely but if we don't get capital dollars from the county and we don't have land we can't build schools if we don't have land we can't build schools more children keep coming and coming and coming in i don't have seats for bottoms so the question becomes we become in this unending circle of doom because we obviously do not want to squeeze business out, we don't want to squeeze residential, but we have an imbalance. And the question is, I think especially for this committee, is how do we manage the imbalance that we are having in the, in the county as a whole so that everyone moves in the direction that we want to do? And I think that is why this committee is so important because we, have, we say a lot of stuff that's not popular, but reality is reality. So. So speaking about hot popular stuff, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not sure where it is, so you know we can kick it down a can, but down the road. But so, is there a sensitivity analysis? Because essentially, last week we, Dr. Montrano, talked about you know the law requires that you know whatever we spend becomes the floor, and then there's also the the maintenance of effort on top of that. So even if we said we were going to increase school spending, well, it's still going to continue to ratchet up. And there's no, it's legislative. There's no way to stop it. So then the only real option we have is to continue to increase taxes. And there has to be a point when humans say, I'm not coming here, or I'm not driving in the traffic to get here, and businesses say, I'm not coming here. And so do we have any idea of what leeway we have left for raising taxes before everybody says to help. Because to me, the only option is to cut the school budget. And in order to do that, we have to talk to our delegation and get politicians to say the unpopular thing of, hey, we need to put in a bill that the county now has the ability to cut the school budget regardless because we don't have the money to do it. So is there a sensitivity thing to be able to say? Or do we not? I mean, we might not have it. I mean, I think, you know, I'll, I'll just say it. I, I think that probably the answer would be no. Um, and, I mean, I, and I think just being easy, I think just because of the, you know, as, as Christina mentioned, and, and because of the selling point 
historically having been first and foremost education schools I mean, even if you look at, and it's not, I think, in this presentation, but even, I forgot who it was, one we saw the other day with the leadership of County, when you also break down also the education level attainments and so forth for just the Howard County population residency, obviously, when you look at the number of people with um, <coughs> four-year and postgraduate degrees, et cetera, I mean, we, we reflect the fact that we value education. And so... For us to actually say we're going to decrease it and on the heels of what Kerwin, the Kerwin Commission is saying, just the, I, I think both community and politically, I don't see I don't see us decreasing that just because right now again with Kerwin, we end up having to figure out how to pay for it anyway if we did try to go back. But part of fiscal, part of education is fiscal responsibility. We can't just pretend there's money there. When it's not there. In terms of sensitivity, you know, I think Heidi presented a slide the first day about our tax rates. So our, our income tax rates is as I say, our property tax rates, I don't remember the exact ranking, are in the top two, three or, three or four, seven. seven. Uh, so there's not a lot of ways to go. And in terms of where we're going, I mean, one of the things that worries me is why we moved to Maryland in 1992. Montgomery County was the technology center for Washington, was the place where all the professionals were. Uh, you know, and, and you know, flash forward 25 years, you know, Montgomery we added more jobs the last uh, since the 2009 in Montgomery County. Did. Our population growth is higher. Our, you know, and it's probably because half of Howard County moved from Montgomery to here uh, because because of the issues <laughs> that we're now facing. Well, why did they move to Howard County? There's for the schools and lower, lower yeah. cost of living. And I'm on the and I'm on the top. Real quick, then you guys can continue fighting. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. I mean, this could be left for DPZ as well. Yeah. So you said you had a national company that was looking for 300 acres or 30. 30? I don't think it's 30. 30, 30, 30 acres of land. Yeah. Um, there are plenty of 30 acre parcels. They're just parking lots in this county. Mm. What, and maybe the DPZ can add, answer this better? We overpark this county. If you fly over from BWI and you pass over Howard County, it's acres of asphalt with nothing on it, not creating any tax revenue, not creating any jobs, not creating any housing, not creating any use, but including the test be possible. Um, do you guys work with DPZ and with the council as we're heading into zoning to do something about the overparking, the over asphalt of a lot of our commercial development? And do you work with DPZ on assembling parcels along Route 1? Because I know the Route 1 corridor's problem is that there are 20,000 landowners with yep. quarter acre parcels that yep. have a hubcap shop. Yep. How does that process work? I mean, we have the land, it's just poorly, poorly used. Yeah. And a lot of that's, you know, legacy. It's, you know, legacy. Route 1 is, you know, suffering from <coughs> years of legacy, you know, development prior to, you know, zoning and things like that. So. Kind of is what it is. We're trying to figure out what does Route One look like. What are what are the things that could make Route One better to help assemble parcels? I mean, in terms of government, what are your what are the control dials you have? Um, you have cash to buy parcels and assemble them. Well, that's probably not really a great option because there's not a lot of cash. You have zoning that will allow certain things to happen, and you have tax uh, you know policy, right? So through certain tax policies, tax credits, or, and or zoning that allows certain densities or certain things to happen, you have to basically do, you have those two controls, right? You have to close the gap between what somebody thinks their quarter acre parcel is worth, and frequently it's a million dollars, and the market thinks it's worth you know, $200,000. With those two controls, you have to do something to close that gap, either through tax policy or what I can do with it once it's zoned the right way. Yeah, I mean, and like your arrow shot of, of Columbia Gateway right there. I understand it's hard to build a subterranean garage or mm -hmm. a parking deck, but you, just, you have the acreage in there if yeah. those buildings were higher and if there wasn't all the surface parking. That's why, we're, that's why we talk about Gateway as the <coughs> next, the future place for, for Howard County. I mean, downtown Columbia plan, it is what now, 15 years old? 
or so, maybe coming up on 20, when it was first started to get into the process of let's think about downtown differently, let's plan it, and now you're starting to see the, the impact of that, but that takes a while. Good, good plan in place as it relates to, you know, the, you know what, it, what it means in terms of jobs and tax base and, and housing. Now let's look forward, what's next? And that's why we talk about, we talk about Gateway. It's 900 acres on one of the busiest roads in North America, for God's sakes. 60% of it is open space, 20% of it is surface road. Um, let's rethink about gateway, right? And so that's why we put this one here because, you know, where are we going to grow? Where can we grow without the challenges of, you know, 17 different, you know, landholders within a you know, quarter mile stretch of, of road? This is the next, the next place. It is, you know, 920 acres, 8.1 million square feet of, of space, and there is potential here to do something about it. That is downtown Columbia inside of the outline of Gateway. So you can almost fit two and a half downtowns inside of Gateway, just to give you a sense of the scale of potential here. So let's rethink about Gateway. Let's, you know, so we're definitely engaged with DPZ as they're starting their master plan process to rethink how we, uh, how we use Gateway. 216 acres of surface parking, there you go. 155 acres, you got more surface parking than you have buildings, right? So, you know, there are things we can do with, with downtown, uh, with, with Gateway that, you know, provide for, you know, more, more access, more roads, more density, smarter use of that, absolutely. It's not that we don't have it, but it's going to take a while because you know, it just takes a while. Let's start thinking about it, adding the amenities and the things that will attract, you know, the live, work, play, because that's where talent wants to be, that's where companies want to be near the talent. Let's use Gateway in a, in a smarter way. So. Um, we can get into into that, you know, in more detail. But the takeaway is, yeah, there's 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 things to do. Um, just to leave you with, the Maryland Innovation Center is how we're addressing, you know, small business support and uh, small business creation. We're creating the Maryland Innovation Center in the Gateway in the Gateway Building. Um, we are the idea here is to bring in you know not only startup companies but resources that help our existing businesses grow, addressing that middle market small company scale up, and it's a variety of resources, talent, regional, national, and international uh, partners that help our startup companies and our existing businesses grow. Uh, one of the components of that is an international soft landing zone to help international companies establish a, uh, a footprint in the, in the U.S., in the mid-Atlantic market. We put a roof over their head and they test the market to see if this is a good market for them to be in. The idea is we house them for a short while and then they grow it into the community, hiring local talent and adding to the tax base. So right now the lobby is under construction. You will, uh, if you've ever been into the Gateway building, uh, this is what it will look like in about three weeks. Um, the third floor is, uh, is completed and the rest of the building is close to completion and we work closely with our good partners at the community college there. Downtown Columbia and Maple Lawn continue to be strong business drivers and um, you know you see the development of downtown and that um, but, uh, you know we are you know blessed to have that project um, it's be a great product to sell it solves a lot of problems for businesses looking to be in a live work play environment adding to the tax base, which is, uh, you know, what uh, we're in the business of. I'll leave this for the other guys in terms of future growth. Um, any questions that you've got? Um, I can take one or two quickly. Zach will be here for the balance of the day. Seth, thank you. Thank you. I think we have to wrap up. Well, this is great, and also I like some of the discussion earlier. These are important subjects to talk about, but we do have a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is Jen Hall. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, honored to be up here presenting to economists for a forecast. So uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll solve the problem today. So I'm talking about the national economy going down to the state economy. A little bit, um, this is really about an hour presentation, but I'm going to condense down to 20 minutes, so I'll be skipping through a lot of slides, but you have the slide deck uh, available to you. We want to kind of talk a little bit about sort of the national sort of uh, uh, picture a little bit at a, at a broad level. So number one is, you know, I would argue that the one thing that's certain about the national economy is with uncertainty. Um, in terms of legislation uncertainty, um, really sort of happening, we have, you know, a divided House and Senate. We have a... Um, 
tweet, uh, a policy by tweet, um, a, 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 a president, it's good or bad, however you want to take it, but it does create a lot of uncertainty in the markets, and uncertainty is not a strong um, asset for business to work with. They want to know certainty. As, as Larry pointed out, certainty is critical to be able to make long-term decisions. And so we're seeing firms sitting a little bit on the outside, not, not, not putting in um, um, uh, their accumulated capital from the, uh, uh, the recent tax cut into the back into the market. Firms are all struggling with labor, labor shortages um, in terms of demographics. We're not growing as fast as we once did in the uh, in the 60s and 70s. We're slowing down our, our labor uh, labor growth. Uh, work rates are are, are are now fairly low. Um, so that's a concern as we won't have as many uh, future workers coming in. We're seeing that uh, more and more, especially in some industries where there are openings that remain open for, uh, for years. Um, in spite of the low unemployment rate, we're still seeing sort of wage growth sort of you know, moderate, not, not very strong. But we're also seeing a very lower, uh, lower labor force participation rate, uh, which is about a loss of about 5 million workers in the, uh, in the overall economy. So um, I'm just going to give you some highlights. Uh, so, looking, this is the last five recoveries uh, since uh, World War II, historically. We're about 124 months into a recovery, maybe more 125. One of the longest, longest recovery we've, we've had. But you'll notice in 1960, uh, our growth rate of GDP was about six, uh, four, almost 5%. We're down about 2.2%. Driving that is basically how the world economy looks. And so, in 1960, 15 years after World War II, we were really the only economy available. So when we grew, when we had a recession, we recovered, all that economic activity took place here. We built more cars, built the tires in one of the cars, built the windshield wipers in one of the cars, um, you know, we made the radios, we made the TVs, all that stuff we built. Um, we also were growing fairly fast. This is the sort of the uh, baby boom generation kind of coming, coming into their fruition. Um, and as we kind of move forward to, to historically, we kind of see that basically that growth rate, each of subsequent year, each of subsequent recovery has sort of been you know, less and less, landing in 2009, most recent recovery. Um, driving some of that is demographic growth. So you know we're not having, we're not growing the labor force as much, um, which basically means you know again we're not um, able to fill those jobs and, and grow those jobs. And I'll, I'll point out a slide that shows sort of net new jobs created. But also the fact is that much of the growth that comes from a recovery now is dissipated. So half of the imported goods coming into the U.S. are intermediate goods. So when you buy a Chevy Silverado, it is less domestic content than, say, a Toyota Corolla. Part of that is because basically uh, GM is sourcing some of its tires, other things to outside countries, bringing them all in. We have a sort of a worldwide supply chain for many of our goods and services. So whenever there's a change in policy, a tariff, that impacts those, um, um, those producers uh, rather dramatically. So uh, GDP. Uh, Good growth, not the 3% growth as predicted that needs to pay, pay back the tax, um, tax cuts, but generally we've had solid steady growth um, you know, for the last 124 months, which has been good. Our GDP, we're a, we're a nation of see it, want it, buy it. 70% of our economic activity is driven by consumer decisions. So when you know, we, we, were, we organize holidays around shopping, so Black Friday is a very, very popular holiday. We have hotel packages that you can stay and shop. Uh, but generally speaking, 3.2% consumers feel pretty good about their, uh, their wallet. They want to go out and spend money, which is solid. As long as consumers are fairly happy, we're, we're good. Uh, private investment, again, anything is used to, to provide or produce goods or services. It falls under this also um, housing. This has been kind of declining, which is a little bit of concern. Some of this is um, inventory replenishment. Um, but also investment in new factories has sort of been uh, uh, a bit down the um, last several uh, quarters. Government spending is up um, in spite of the fact that we aren't in a major conflict or in a major recession. Uh, some of this might be driven by a little bit of pre-census uh, 2020 hiring, but generally speaking we are increasing. This does sort of uh, uh, bode well. Our de uh, deficit this year is almost approaching a trillion dollars, a rather significant uh, number. Uh, net exports, again, one of the things is you know, we, in spite of the fact that the tariffs, we still want to import goods because, again, many people for imported goods and domestic goods, but oftentimes they are not the domestic equivalent to produce those goods. We're almost a trillion dollars uh, trade deficit, um, a lot um, higher than it was in, um, in the, uh, during the recession. Unemployment has is, is is gone down. We're about 3.5%, historically one of the lowest levels of unemployment. Challenge has been 
we are now seeing the same wage growth uh, that we would expect to see with such a low um, unemployment rate. One of the things that's also occurring is pre-recession um, labor force participation rate, which is basically um, the uh, labor force, which is those unemployed, and unemployed is defined as people actively looking for work, plus employed, divided by the population 16 to 64, gives us the labor force participation rate. Pre-recession, that was about 66%. Post-recession, that's been about 63, 64%. That translates about 5 million missing workers in the economy that are unaccounted for, that basically have stepped out of the labor force, um, which is sort of a, you know, a, a, a pause for concern. The other good news is, is you know, uh, during the recession, we had a high underemployment rate, which is the number um, shown in the bars in yellow, almost 18%. These are individuals who want to work full-time but are working part-time, individuals who are marginally attached labor, to the labor market. Generally speaking, that number has come down to about 8%, which is, which is a good sign. But generally speaking, we are concerned about the participation rate. Go ahead. One quick question. Is the, the 5 million lost workers? Yes. They're, they're in your basement playing Call of Duty now. <laughs> that was, that's actually my question. Yeah. Is, it pre, is it early retirement people? Um, it, could be, it, it could be out across the spectrum. It could be everything from individuals. So, you know, in, in the Midwest, <laughs> we're, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of individuals who can't get into the labor market because they can't pass the drug test. And heavy manufacturing requires being able to have the drug test. Opioid crisis has been critical. Um, individuals retiring early, they never got back into labor market after the uh, recession. Um, that recession hit hard individuals, um, white males, 50 plus um, in construction, finance, and were really hard, um, hard in and hard to recover. Um, and then um, college students who graduated in 2008 uh, probably didn't get into work in the best job market and probably lifetime learnings, uh, earnings for those individuals who graduated 2008, 2009, probably about close to about 100 to $200,000 less than students who graduated um, a couple of years ago. But they also be in your basement coming back. Boom around. Boom around. Um, now, the good news is there are more jobs than there are unemployed individuals. More jobs than unemployed individuals. Now, so for any of us who are looking for IT workers, it's tough. Uh, for many looking for very specialized skills, it's very difficult. One of the other things that's also going on is some of the job growth has been occurring in high cost metro areas. <coughs> which means that housing affordability is a big challenge as well as lack of adequate transportation um, uh, for individuals. So individuals you know, are able to work, but they can't afford to live in the work. Or if they're, if they're living in, in the area, they have to drive an hour to get to the job, because usually they're entry level um, jobs. So the challenge has been we have a mismatch in geography, oftentimes of uh, jobs and people. And some of that mismatch is being driven by the fact that the high, high housing costs are driving people out. So the Bay Area is a, is a perfect example. Um, San Diego, for example, has a median home price of uh, north of a half a million dollars. Um, so if you're an entry-level worker, it's, it's very difficult to kind of get at that market. And the wages in those, some of those areas aren't commensurate with the cost of living necessarily, as one would expect. So that is kind of a, a, an ongoing challenge. The transportation also remains a big challenge, too. We're also seeing 16-year-olds, the number of 16-year-olds getting licenses actually is falling uh, compared to what it was in, in years past. So many of our individuals aren't going to be driving. So self-driving cars are going to be critical. But then the other issue is, again, parking um, and also um, access to those vehicles. Because if, you, if you're in a rural county, it's very difficult to get your job. Um, and some parts of Maryland you know, are far removed from the bus line or any kind of transportation. So they often are facing challenges even getting to a job. Willing, willing and able to work. Um, we're seeing household income going up. But in spite of the fact that we're seeing um, low unemployment rate, a lot of uh, surplus of jobs. Yeah. Wage growth has not been as spectacular as one would expect, given sort of these these, these metrics. The good news is we're obviously seeing a, a solid growth in, in income across all the quintile levels, from the bottom to the top, which is very positive. Uh, consumer sentiment uh, base level is 100. You can see in the uh, recession areas, about 55. We've been bouncing around about 98 to 99 um, last couple of years depending upon sort of what, what tweet goes out um, will determine sort of how happy uh, people tend to be. But generally speaking, we're, we're much happier than we were during the recession, which kind of makes sense. Um, housing starts were fairly high, 12-year high, um, nowhere near where we were. Uh, a peak, about 2.5 million um, housing units started. We're just under about uh, 1,500. 
So two policies that come up, tariffs um, come, have kind of come up. That is sort of, you know, in spite of what people might believe, um, consumers and or firms pay for the tariffs. It is not the country of origin that pays for the tariffs. So um, we pay for it, or firms that import the goods absorb those costs. Um, Moody's analytics expect about 300,000 for your jobs. That could rise to almost a half million to a million million by the end of 2020. Um, that is an issue, again, we, we agree that there are some trade practices done by China and other partners that is perhaps unfair, but generally speaking, tariffs do impact our bottom line, our, our consumers, um, and our firms. Uh, tax cuts, again, we had a huge, um, we had a major tax cut, but for some states like Maryland, where the salt, um, we actually now, some of us pay more in, in household personal income taxes. Corporate taxes fell um, significantly, um, and individual uh, taxes fell by a small amount. Um, some people have said that it's rather sugar high. We've had the initial boost, but we're not seeing continued impact. National debt, um, $65,000 uh, 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 per person, so all of us owe $65,000. What's kind of sad is that's almost double what it was um, going into the recession. So we've doubled the amount of debt per person um, in, in, in our economy. The concern is, obviously, is we, if we have the next downturn, would we have the capacity to basically generate fiscal policy um, this would help us uh, smooth over. So that is, uh, it, it, it is a, a, a concern. Just, just quick question, how much of that debt is, or I guess is there, but are you able to tell that, I guess in a sense is, I guess what you might call new debt versus debt that was a carryover, or that was received as a result, or, uh, or that was accumulated as a result of various things that people might have gone through recession-wide, or coming out of the recession, and so as a result, they, they left the recession obviously in a different place than they went into it. Oh, so this is government debt. So this is basically oh, okay. this, this, is, this okay. is our spending. Okay. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. you know, Sorry, right. So you know the good news is if Power County could do this, all problems solved. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, we have to have a balanced budget. Uh, federal government does not have a balanced budget. It's the bar of the good news is, in spite of the, that debt, we're, we're we're borrowing the money at a very low interest rate um, compared historically. I mean, I remember in the in the 1980s it was a double digit um, interest rate. So we're definitely being able to. Um, you know, a um, couple of sort of uh, unnerving things going on. Um, students are graduating with a significant amount of debt, about $30,000 in debt, and that continues to go on, which means they will likely forestall purchasing homes, which means they, they won't buy as many appliances, furniture, all that good stuff, which will have downstream effects across the economy. It means they're living with us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's good news, bad news. Um, we're also seeing more automobile loans being underwater than they were before. So before the recession, about 20% of automobiles were considered to be underwater. So that is to say you come in, you buy a car, then you trade it in, but you really owe more on the car than it was worth, and you just carry that loan forward. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, it went up from about, um, as I said, 20% pre recession, now it's almost 30, 33%. So people are carrying a lot more debt, and also it's longer term. Because basically they're trying to fit the monthly income to fit their, their, um, their monthly payment to fit their, um, their income needs. So we're seeing loans go from five to now eight years plus in terms of the uh, borrowing. Um, the stock market has been rather volatile. Uh, we've seen a lot of noise, and it's, it's sort of looking sort of, and, and maybe, even, I, I know some of you have done some analysis of sort of day of tweet and sort of what has happened to the stock market. These are absolute changes. And you can sort of see that we're having these big swings um, most recently um, and compared to historically we've not had as many uh, wide swings um, as recently. Manufacturing has entered uh, into a recession, sort of the, uh, uh, the supply, um, uh, manufacturer supply index sort of below 50, which is considered to be sort of a slowdown. This sort of resulted in some decline in truck driving, um, and, and truck, uh, truck driver employment which has been both good and bad, uh, uh, good in the sense that it's been difficult to attract CDL drivers, bad in the sense that this sort of is not a, a, a good trend we want to continue. Uh, Germany, one of the largest economies in, in the EE, uh, where it's a sort of uh, on a great recession. Interest rates in, in Europe tend to be negative. Uh, Maryland, we tend to have good, um, solid growth, 1% uh, annual growth. I was convinced we were going to um, have negative uh, um, job growth this year. Um, but most recent data shows it's the last four or five months we have increased jobs to 31,000. So Maryland's uh, job uh, total over 2019 was about 31,000, about 1% 1 growth in jobs. Um, <coughs> unemployment is, is in line with U.S. average. Uh, government is a big portion of our uh, of our GDP, about 19%. Uh, 
compared to nationally 11 percent, compared to our neighbor Virginia about 17 <coughs> percent. And this is all past government, state, local, <coughs> and federal. You can all see where uh, you know as beds and meds. You can sort of see in, in healthcare, um, professional scientific services, accommodations and, and food services. Administrative support, waste management, remediation. This is not the Sopranos um, area. This is a lot of his temp workers are, are, are captured in that in, in that field as well. Um, Forty percent of job openings in Maryland are in two fields: uh, computer and mathematical occupations and healthcare. Um, these are critical. I'm um, again part of this is driven by demographics. We're getting older, and the other thing is driven by technology. We're getting dumber. Um, so basically, our, our devices are getting smarter, we're just getting dumber. As a result, basically, we have a lot more um, challenges with us. So but typically speaking, these are, 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 are openings that need to be filled and are continuing to be open. And this is, as long as I've been looking at this, has been a rather large number. So forecasting, uh, my, my forte. Um, so we're, we're looking at, you know, maybe I'll add a little uh, one over here. But we're looking at about a 1% one, 1 growth um, overall. In, in Maryland. So these are sort of by region, 89,000 jobs in Central Maryland, uh, 67,000 in the sub uh, suburban uh, Washington area, 12,000 Eastern Shore, 8,000, 7,000. These are all jobs. So these are jobs that are due to retirements, people leaving, um, as well as net new jobs. If I just look at new jobs created, the number goes down rather dramatically. This is our forecast, uh, 32,000 for 2020, eight exactly in 2021, not nine. That's not, so my, my comment, see, really, seriously? Yes, eight. Okay. I, will, you know, I will sell the straight face, and then mine is 37. So we're probably looking at about a 10,000 know, job uh, per year, about 0.3% uh, uh, job, job growth overall on average. You know, much of this could be weighted probably towards the uh, 2020, but it's again declining. Uh, we may lose nine. Or may gain sure. um, These are the, where the, the sectors we believe again, people are getting older, uh, dumber in terms of their devices, so we, these are top growth areas uh, per year. Occupations, personal care and services, food prep, we want to be fed, and then computer and mathematical again. And these, are the, these are by occupation, so these are the major occupational groups. And this is by, um, by um, by zone, and the zone refers to basically, you know, little or no preparation, so you have a pulse, you show up to the job. Here you have a, a, a doctorate, or a MD, or a JD, or a CPA, and you can sort of see much of the job growth in Maryland is skewed towards the more educated um, uh, 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 occupations. And these could also include certification, just into certification. So, you know, again, as we grow more into the IT field, we expect to see more individuals getting more industry certification, sort of as a badge, rather than perhaps a degree, because again, those certifications validate the KSAs that are needed in those, in those particular fields, and it's very important. So I think that is it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rowney, one quick question I think we were forecasting shows that the uh, economy is going to drop in jobs in the so this one, so we anticipate, so one of the things is, is and we're seeing a lot of economists, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm like a weather forecaster. I, I could be right. I, I could be wrong, but you could be right. But generally speaking, you know, we, we've had seen such long legs in this recovery. We're also facing a couple of headwinds. Number one is so the international field. So we've seen the, 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 the coronavirus come about. The last one with the SARS virus, about a $40 billion impact worldwide. About 900 people died. Thus far, China's had 1,000 people die. So we expect that to kind of be a bit of a handle. We've seen sort of Middle East sort of the, the pop up, the oil prices have been kind of popping up. Again, those could be black swan events um, that could occur. Uh, we're seeing uh, challenges with getting enough labor force. So workforce shortages mean that basically firms can't grow. They can't grow, they can't, you know, we're not seeing economic activity. So that is driving it. We're seeing basically some of the situations, especially here in Maryland, we're seeing basically the federal government being sort of pushed out into the broader community, so the USDA Research Center was not pushing in Kansas City. Um, you know, again, part of this is also as, as the federal government gets some sort of downside, we're seeing sort of slower employment in those particular areas. Um, not many people are signing up to work in the federal government as once before, especially if it's not going to be located in other areas um, outside of um, Washington, D.C. So kind of a lot of things are kind of going on. Um, now, the good news is I probably won't be in the committee in 2022, maybe, maybe not, so you can't hold me accountable. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. That's full cash's job, right? That's full cash's job. That's all. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Finch? Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Did you go to some of the notes before this? We did not. So, of course, I think we're both too busy. <laughs> 
Um, thank you. All right, so I'm going to breeze over the first two parts because I think Bryce covered them you know, really well. I'm just going to hit some high points. And then I'll focus really on the Howard County economy and my personal income forecast, which Holly is this. Uh, I mean, the, the big issue that I really want to talk about from a national recovery standpoint is predicting when the recession is. So as Darius said, um, you know, you, you can't hold this accountable. We've, we've been saying it's going to come for a while. You know, I, I've been on the committee for 10 years, and nobody's holding me accountable yet, Darius, so you're, okay. you're pretty lucky. Um, <laughs> so um, the issue is the risk of recession, because that's what's going to drive our fiscal situation in the county. Because I mean, you understand the county, you have to understand the nation, you have to understand the state, because those are what, you know, to a large extent, drive what's going to happen in the county. So, you know, extensions don't die of old age, as Jenny Yellen said, you know, but, but this one's getting pretty old as long as it's here. So the issue is, what's the risk of recession? So Moody's puts it at 10% now, which is down from what I presented last year from 17%. But I, for the next six months. But I, 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 we talked, I'm going to get to the point. That's why I put the butt here, right here. But uh, different financial model to look at other things other than some of these other things have predicted uh, the probability of recession as high as 62% in the coming year. This is different methods that have used financial measures are saying it's much more probable than traditional economic measures. So all I'm pointing out here is that we have a risk of a recession. I've been saying it for two years. I'm going to be right in the next two years. Uh, so you know, why can it keep going? So why can there be some source of optimism? Darius pointed out, you know, five million workers. So there are uh, not attached right now. So bringing them back in, inflation is low, so there's no reason for us to engineer a recession. Um, but as Darius also said, lots of you know, the fiscal stimulus is winding down, trade wars, and global economic uncertainty. So again, the issue is the recession's coming. We do need to plan for it. I don't think it's necessarily going to come this year. It's going to hit in the next two years, as Darius's numbers say. Let's skip over this. Um, you know, the Maryland outlook, again, I agree. The, the real issue in for Maryland Nash, you know, in its role in the national economy is we're driven by federal employment. We have a real business climate problem in Maryland. We'll be releasing the Maryland business climate uh, survey pretty soon. You know, businesses have a better view of Maryland's business climate, but they do complain about taxes, regulations, and workforce availability. Uh, one of the key issues in Maryland right now from that survey is uh, just over half of businesses, uh, about 30% of businesses are adding jobs in the last year, and half of all businesses can't find the workers they need. So it's not only so it's these replacement workers that Darius talked about as well. So the real issue for Maryland is how do, and, and really the county, is how do we redeploy our economic assets to focus more on private sector growth and federal growth, which is, as Darius said, at risk. So that's um, my state and national. Darius covered it, but I'll answer any questions if you think I differ from them. No questions here? I'm going to try to go fast so we can talk about it. For my Howard County outlook, now I'm going to talk about the same stuff I talked about last year. What are the county sources of revenue? Really, two sources of revenue, property taxes and income taxes account for between 70% of all funding and 89% you know, of general fund revenues. So what drives property taxes and income taxes here in the county? Population, population growth, economic growth, like Larry talked about, the jobs coming into the county. And then the real estate market, which drives, you know, is, is impacted by population growth, which then drives <coughs> property taxes. So these are the real key things we really have to think about at a county. So population growth, you know, one of the issues we have in Howard County is adapting to this. When you look at how the county is doing relative to the nation and uh, Maryland, we're growing much more rapidly in terms of population. We are the, you know, we added, we're the fastest growing jurisdiction in terms of the percentage change in population in Maryland. And we're the fourth largest in terms of the gross numbers of people you know, compared to the other counties here in Maryland, most of whom have, all of whom, have much larger population bases. You know, Montgomery County is about three to four times the size of the population as, Maryland, as Howard County, but we added about half as many people as they have in the last 10 years. How much of that is within Maryland, people from Baltimore City and Montgomery County? Okay, got, got a slide. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, domestic and international migration is what's driving growth here. So these are the components of population change. This is Howard County, so we added about 36,000. This is a different source, so it's a little different than the other numbers. Um, about half of that, or about 40% of it comes from the natural increase in population. The rest comes from migration, people moving into the county from internationally and domestic. 
So, and Howard County is the experience the highest level of domestic in migration. So we're attracting the most people in the state of Maryland from other places within the United States. Um, you know, when you look at the, but so again, a lot of that is, and those are people coming from other parts of Maryland, you know, tremendously. So when you look at the IRS migration, what you have here is the total number of people moving in, total number of people moving out, the net change. So we're getting a net change of households every year. You know, and that's all coming from in-state migration. If more people move out of Maryland, from Howard County move out of Maryland than move into Howard County from outside of Maryland, it's all domestic and they're all coming from Prince George's, Montgomery, Baltimore County. Not all of them, of course. Did I get your question? Nailed it. Nailed it, there we go. Uh, one of the key issues here in these migration patterns, however, is that the households moving into the county have lower income than the households moving out. That's pretty common. You know, people retiring at their older age have higher income than the people moving out, know, starting their households, especially in Howard County with people trying to attract. So the people replacing the people moving out have lower incomes, which again has an impact on tax revenues. Uh, one of the great things about our population growth, as Larry talked about, is that we are attracting a great residential base, a great workforce base. So we have a high household income, it's 11th highest in the nation. Zach used a different source, his was nine. One of the cautionary things here is we used to have the second highest median household income in the nation, so we fall. Uh, we have a higher labor force participation rate at 71% compared to Maryland at 68%. Both of those are substantially above the national average. Do we have among the most educated workers, I think Zach, you said it was the sixth in the country? Uh, I believe it depends on fourth. Uh, higher education. Uh, yeah, bachelor's, 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 I believe, is fourth. Four. And uh, professional degree, I believe, is seventh. Okay, I, I was close, right? Yep. Uh, in terms of educated, we have 62% of workers in Howard County have a bachelor's or above compared to 40% in Maryland. 31% of them have graduate degrees. So the people coming into this county are highly educated and they work in professional occupations. 60% of workers are employed in management business, you know, the professional services, professional occupations. Uh, and why is that? Because we serve two labor markets. Lots of people live and find jobs here because we have an expanding portion of people working in the county, but people predominantly move here because we're close to two major markets, Baltimore and Washington. So we're really in that sweet spot by attracting a great workforce. I'm sorry I'm going fast. I know Holly wants me to, to, to get done. So you know, population growth is driving workforce. One of the good news here is, again, our you know, Howard County is blue. This is the labor force. Uh, growth rate, and Maryland is blue, Howard County is uh, orange. We're growing much more rapidly. What is good news, and Holly and I talked about this yesterday, is the Howard County labor force expanded by 2% last year, number of employed residents by 2.3%, uh, compared to very slow growth in 2018. I, 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 the best I can figure out is people were very uncertain in 2018 about the path of federal spending, the path of the economy, so they didn't hire as many people. So again, we've returned to the traditional level of 2% growth in workers and uh, employed residents. All right, so kind of questions about population growth? I do have one uh, question. I'm not sure if this is the metric that you'll actually do. You made the if point, not, I'll make it up. Okay. <laughs> you made the point earlier about the uh, transition of people coming into the county. You can tell that there is a decline in the income uh, level associated with those. Is there any kind of metric that actually also correlated shows but the cost or services that those people come in need <coughs> on an average type basis. Uh, the county does track that in our APCO study. We kind of talked about yeah. that. I don't have all those slides up yeah. and ready. Uh, but I mean, the, it, it's tied to land use. So I think Jeff might be talking a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll cover a little bit on the fiscal. Jeff's going to mm -hmm. cover a little bit of that. So I'm going to move on if, if that's okay. The drop from 2 to 11 in per capita income. Is that because the nine jurisdictions that were, one, that were between us and those two spots became wealthier, or we did not grow as fast, or we actually lost income? Maybe when we did it last year, last year we lost income. For some reason, our, our uh, uh, estimated median household income fell. I don't have a good explanation for why that happened. Um, oh, exactly. uh, just, just a note, um, we took this slide out, but uh, the number of uh, single person households and non-family households has gone up. So you're kind of diluting these double income households. 
that that can be part of it. I just we, we meant to put that in ours. We, we I agree. I was going I was going to go there too. Great minds must think alike. Uh -huh. The issue is we do have as Jeff is going to talk about here yes. the issue of the changing dynamic of the types of households we're forming in Mar in Howard County. You know, as we build less single family homes, we're building more condominiums, apartments, those types of things. Those tend to attract you know people with lower incomes and people buying a mansion in the western part of Howard County. Not low income individuals, people with lower incomes than people who buy single family homes. And places like Loudoun County that are in the top two or three or five every year, you know, don't have that transition yet. They will at some point, but they don't have it now. So they're attracting more and more people in the single family, you know, traditional suburban house. So back to the jobs. In terms of economic growth, as Larry talked about, so I'm going to go real fast here, so hit me with questions. Uh, if, uh, and I'll stop. We have the fastest growing economy, one of the fastest growing economies in the region. We've outpaced the state, the metro area, both metro areas, and the state of Maryland. You know, only a few jurisdictions in, in Virginia have higher rates of growth than we've had. Again, when you look at this, this is the post-recession. So from the trough of the recession to 2018, the most recent time for which we have data, what is total employment growth up? I did wrong, sorry about that. Uh, we added the second highest number of jobs, highest percentage change in jobs. And again, I talked about this. We added more jobs than Montgomery County since the trough of the recession. Uh, and they have an the economic basis in terms of employment about three times large. So again, we are attracting businesses into the county for a variety of reasons, you know, location, cost, those types of things. Now in terms of the county, one of the things going forward that I'll go into over real fast, because Larry talked about it a good bit, is we have a diverse uh, and strong employment base. As I said, we've outpaced the state and peer regions in growth since 2009. We have an expanding base of specialized employment across diverse sectors. So what this slide shows, this will be in the report when we issue it, is the employment, the location quotient. What the location quotient measures is the concentration of employment in the particular industry compared to the national average. So if the national average in manufacturing is about 14%, in Maryland it's about 7%, so we would have a location quotient of 0.5, half the national average. So a location quotient over 1.2 is typically considered what's called concentrated, it means you have a specialty in that industry. Less means you don't have it. Those with high typically are your growth industries. Those lower are things you don't necessarily want to invest in unless you have a reason to grow that sector. So when you look at these location quotients as a measure of what this county specializes in, so LQ over 1, we specialize in construction. So building the buildings that Larry's trying to fill, building the houses that people were moving into for that population growth. Wholesale trade, Jessup. You know, we need to go into that. Uh, real estate and leasing, again, related to population and you know, uh, construction activities. And as Larry talked about, professional services. So this is what is the driver of the county, state, and regional economy. These are law firms, IT, R&D, those types of businesses. We have about three times the concentration of the national average of those jobs here in Howard County. So again, these are jobs in the county. Yeah, that was that. So these are jobs in the county, not... Not the, not the people, people of jobs sectors. held by county residents. Correct. These are the jobs in the county. Um, so a, a lot of the, the presentation by the Economic Development Authority in your presentation suggests that there have been a lot of positive things that have taken place in the county in terms of uh, the, the rate of unemployment being very low, very low. The, tax, the, the tax base being you know, pretty high. Uh, in terms commercial of growth, tax base, commercial sure. tax base, right. and you know, uh, in terms of income tax base as well, because you know, you you showed that uh, people been, moving into the county, people moving in the county. So, uh, why is why has the county been facing fiscal problems for the last few years? Uh, I'm kind of talking about the economy, so I'll, I'll give a quick answer. Incomes, as we all know, have been suppressed by the recession and the slow growth and wage growth from the recovery in the recession. So we haven't seen wage growth. So we haven't seen the income side rise in commensurate with past recoveries. And then the spending side. So we have spent more money. I mean, I've been on the committee, and I'll take my point of the blame. I've been on the committee for about 10 years. During the really good years, we said, let's you know, spend more money on a variety of things than we, you know. So, so the answer is, 
income growth that uh, income tax growth that has been slower than historic recoveries, uh, and expense expenditure growth that has been you know high. Uh, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you have a business, you have less sales and more expenses. You, you have an imbalance. And uh, you know the county is getting full. We're changing from single-family homes to you know uh, attached homes and, and condos. So again, property taxes are growing less rapidly than they did in the past 15 years. So those are the revenues are not growing as fast as expenses. It's pretty simple. Yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, what you heard is on commercial side, there's has been doing good, mm -hmm. but don't forget the commercial of the tax base is well a small portion of the overall mm -hmm. accessible base. Even co commercial base has been picking up speed. Residential fees has been growing slowly. The overall accessible base, based on the state SDAT projection, in the past several years has been between 2 to 3 percent on average, and that's our number one tax base for general fund revenue. Income tax, even the job growth has been average anywhere between half percentage to two percent in the last couple of years, but the wage hasn't picked up as much. And that's including actually a large portion driven by the new residents coming to the county. And so income tax also has been only a couple of percentage a year. So everything combined, we are looking at not bad, but only a couple of percentage growth a year versus expanding side, the cost of providing services are usually going faster than why, that, why that's is a that? Major reason. Can we, can we keep going? Yeah, I'm sorry. We have thousands of more retirees that we are that we are we have promised generations of benefits to. As the county grew in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we hired to meet the new needs of the county, and now those people are retired, and those people are also retiring and they're retiring for longer. Um, and we have to maintain <coughs> the benefits to attract people to continue to provide services for the existing residents. So we have, and you saw from Dr. Martiramo's presentation, we have a pension plan that educates kids on the side. So there are a lot of needs that, you know, we just have, we, we're facing these fiscal headwinds and the 2020s are gonna bring these headwinds in as a gale. And there's really limited resources that we have to address them in any sort of way. And the and I, I, I'll, I'll add something that I, uh, when I get to the end of the, the, of the forecast. So, uh, again, one of the drivers of the county's economy, I would say one of the big drivers of the county's economy is federal procurement. Uh, so these are the total dollars spent in terms of federal procurement in Howard County. I want to point out that NSA is not in here. Nobody's allowed to know what they buy or how much they buy or what they're doing with it. So, um, you know, you know, we had a it declined <coughs> the fiscal crisis but we're back up to below, higher than we were. So federal procurement in Maryland is about $2.5 billion. What has been interesting is that, you know, is increasingly civilian procurement. So we have diversified our procurement base in the county from predominantly DOD oriented to, you know, you know uh, almost 50, 50, you know, 50, 55, 45% DOD and non-DOD. So these are companies like Impact that we've all seen that are doing, and, and the IT that are doing more civilian work. So again, we used to be almost, you know, two-thirds defense. We're now about 55% uh, defense. And, you know, and, uh, God forbid we get another war. Hopefully that stays flat and, and, and we grow. And again, NSA is not in here, so these numbers are probably down by possibly as much as 10%. Uh, what do they buy in terms of industry? It is professional services. So why is our professional services growing so much? Because we have a lot of federal contractors here, a lot of Fort Meade contractors here, and we have APL pool loans at about 40%, uh, and, and that is uh, R&D. So that is what is. Our procurement base is very concentrated in the top 20 firms who account for 87%. So these are the businesses that are growing the county's economy moving into it. We also had a lot of growth. I got, I got sidetracked in terms of corporate headquarters here. Again, these are many of these companies moving offices here to do contracting. So that's my view of, the, of employment. So the first driver is population, which drives income tax. Second driver is employment, you know, jobs in the county, which drives both population growth and the non-commercial, non-residential tax base. Third one is real estate, which adapts to this. So this is very, you know, very convoluted slide as to things. Units sold, which is on this axis, 
uh, units of inventory, which is this axis, and then sales price. So the good news here is that since the recession, units sold is trending up. And this is monthly data, which is why it has these huge variations. I, uh, and inventory is trending down, which means we should see more construction activity if we had the supply of land and experience to build it because there is more demand. And you know, prices have increased above pre-recession levels. So real estate is in recovery. In terms of residential permitting, I think Jeff will hit this, it's been trending up. Huge drop here, but that's almost all. We didn't have any large uh, multi-unit buildings permitted. So this is from Maryland Office of Planning. I'll let Jeff talk about it. Now, sadly, I used to have a great slide on non-residential permitting activity. <coughs> so the buildings that Larry are trying to fill, DMC data isn't populated right now. They couldn't get it to us till next week. But based on data Jeff, data Jeff gave me in the first quarter of 2019, we had 175 million in non-residential business activity according to the Welfare Metropolitan Council, which is more than we had in the previous two years. So we have a good amount of commercial construction going on. So in terms of economic outlook, real quick, you know, Maryland's economy has been a laggard and is slow growing. We're lagging DC and the Virginia in population and employment growth, which impacts the ability of the county to grow. While the recession is not predicted, national growth in, in the next six months based on one measure, it might be predicted based on financial measures, um, national growth has got too slow. As Darius talked about, we can't find workers. The fiscal stimulus, is uh, the sugar high Darius talked about, is going to have less effect in the next coming years than it had in the past. The trade war, global economic uncertainty, and then local constraints on growth. Workforce is at full capacity. We have a high labor force participation rate and low unemployment rate. There's not a lot, a lot, you know, not a lot of those five million missing workers live here in our county. Uh, you know, real estate is in recovery. However, APCO and impact fees, who knows what's going to happen based on that. So that's kind of my summary in terms of the projections that Holly uses to drive her model. These are my projections, which will be in the report. So we're predicting 4.3% in personal income growth in 2019. We had, uh, now why do I bracket this? We don't know, as Darius said, none of us really know when this recession is going to hit. But it's going to hit somewhere in this. You know, I don't think it's going to happen this year, so I think we're in a relatively robust, slightly longer, slower than long term. But it's got to hit sometime in 2020. So all of these numbers are suppressed a bit. And in terms of my forecast, I don't, frankly, we had to rush this project. I'm usually presenting in about two weeks, so I had to rush this. I have not figured out how the impact of AP, factor in, in APFO into my growth model, because we're going to have a slower population growth. So what I did is simply slow down our long-term growth rates. And by next year, if I'm lucky enough to be hired, I will have to come up with a methodology for how to factor in lower population growth. Uh, but we're going to have a slowdown. It's going to impact uh, incomes. It's going to happen in the next two years. So I think that's it. Where are my projections? My projections are in line with Moody's. Last year, we were below them. Last year, I think I was a little bit too conservative. I projected growth of about 3.7%. We actually had, for 2018, you know, we actually had about 6% growth. My 2018 projections were a little better. The one slide that is missing here is when we, I had this last year, we talked about what are the components of population, of personal income growth. And one of the things I think we as a county failed to adapt to is when you looked at the old models, you had both population growth and income growth. So we had lots of people moving into the county. Those people were buying single family homes. They were professionals with high incomes. They, you know, so we were bringing in new high incomes and everybody who moved here in the past were in those jobs and they were having income growth. So as a result, you know, we, we had great years for the 15 years leading up to the mid 2000s. However, since then we've really tamped down on development. What year was that, Jeff, about? When did we put the first slowdown in permitting? It was about 10 years ago? Oh, as far as the APFO? No, pre oh. APFO. Oh. Like, like, like 92, 90, 1992 was when APFO started. No, we had the. We also slowed down development activity. Two thousand, the general plan sort of slowed yeah, down. Yeah, two thousand general plan yeah. kept it from two thousand to about fifteen hundred. But then it's gone up since then. So yeah, there's. Yeah. yeah, so we had so we had a policy change then that slowed mm -hmm. development, and I don't think in, in being on this committee for ten years, I don't think we factored the impact on the long term revenue side. So uh, that's my presentation. Any questions? I know I went really fast.
but we've already had three economics or two economics presentations before and now planning so I mean the fact you're still awake is really good. <laughs> Thank you for both of you. Very efficient about it. Thank you. Jeff, you want to talk about the demographic and the economic So is there, there's one more after this? So I should have what I Yeah, I think that's how I'll come So should I try to use my time? Short, short? 20, I think I've got it. Okay. All right. So as I can go fast. Mine is okay. more qualitative than quantitative. Okay, you're probably invited. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you don't have 53 yeah. slides like uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have 17. I know, that's what I'm saying. So, uh, it's probably a good way to end it. You guys probably all have uh, charts and graphs and numbers to use, so sorry about that. There's some more charts and graphs, so I'll try to be, um, I'll try to present new information. I think this fits really well because the economists talk a lot about the state and the national limit of Howard County. I'm going to focus on Howard County. I'm from DPZ, so we track a lot of the building permits, and I'll talk a bit about AFA, AFA that has been raised. Uh, the question that um, um, Ms. Tag Hagu that raised is a really an important question, and I think the crux of the question. We tried to put together a frequently asked questions uh, document. I don't know if that was been posted yeah, or not. Yeah, I'll check to make sure okay. it's in the drop -off. That wasn't a, yeah, it's a very, it's a good question, because it's, it's sort of a question of like, well, why are we having issues if, if all these great things are happening. So that the, the frequently asked questions, and if I talk a little bit about fiscal impact study here at the end, tries to address some of these questions in a, in a way that was that is at least um, easy to understand. So please take a look at that. Um, so I'm going to talk about in Howard County population trends, and then uh, people you know need to live in housing, so new housing and land uses, uh, past and projection of the future, and then a little bit about the, the reducing impact of capital we had fiscal study that was presented to you last year and talked a bit about that more. So here's the population growth uh, in Howard County um, to 2010. This is from the census, and then these bars are projections moving forward to the future. So the last census, 2010, about 287,000 people. We expect we're going to have about 329,000 people. March or April 1st, in a few months, is the 2020 census, so you'll be getting things in the mail and asking you, I think this time you can actually fill it out online. Yes. So you'll be able to do that. Please, please uh, we're trying to get the word out to, to let people know that the census is very important. So we expect to have about this. Now this is the underlying, this is based on Plan Howard 23rd, which was adopted in 2012, and it's a 20 year plan. So based on that growth projections and, and based on sort of our growth management that was in effect at the time, we expect to have this many people. It's likely that we're not going to achieve that because of the AFRO changes that recently happened. And I'll talk a little bit about, about this, more about that. The other thing is, it was mentioned, we're about to start a new general plan. General plans are done about every 10 years. So DPZ is going to announce to kick off the next general plan in a, in a few weeks. It's a two-year process, a lot of public input. It sets the growth land use of the next 30 years. So um, keep your eye on that. It's really important. The county's changing. It was mentioned during the, during the presentations. We're, we're slowing down naturally anyways because we're running out of land. So the commercial, uh, attracting commercial growth is challenging because we don't have the, the land for it. So the county's sort of turning into a redevelopment mm -hmm. county. So it's really a new paradigm. The next general plan is going to set the stage for that. So it's a really important general plan in the kind of the his, context of history of Howard County. Um, this is the same numbers as before, it's just showing the, the differences between decades. So basically in the 80s we had um, the most growth in terms of absolute numbers, 68,000 people. Um, percentage growth was the greatest in the 70s, almost 100% growth. And you can see what happened in the last decade, 2000, 2010, and this is where we're at now. About the same amount of growth, percentage growth is less, we're projecting moving forward to be even less growth. And then given the recent policy changes, that is likely to be even less. Just wanted to show this quickly, and I can talk too much on the characteristics of the population, but the 2018 American Community Survey numbers just came out, and this shows the population by, by race. And it really just shows that the Howard County is continuing to become uh, diverse over time. And as of 2018, the non-Hispanic white population was 51 at the point. Uh, 1% of the population, so likely by the time the 2000 census comes out, um, the county will be considered majority minority, similar to Montgomery County, PG County, and Baltimore City. So the county is continuing to become 
um, diverse. As far as housing units, so where do pe people live? Um, this is a history of building permits from 2001 to 2019. And in the, in the 2000s, average about 1,500 building permits per year. And then it's a little higher in the last decade, primarily because of the adoption of the Downtown Columbia Plan, which which took place in 2010, so we're redeveloping downtown Columbia and that's adding more units. That's why you kind of see these spikes when apartment units come forward. This is the lowest number of building permits um, since we've been tracking, at least the data I have, 1979. So the number of new housing has uh, been reduced considerably. I wouldn't read all that much into that, in the, at least in the next few years, because there is a fair amount in the pipeline. And so what happens is these are the, the um, types of permits by, by housing unit type. The blue is single family detached, the green is single family attached, and the right is apartment, which includes <coughs> and condo. So you can see there wasn't very many uh, rental or, or apartment buildings <coughs> permitted last year. And that's going to happen. You're going to get these spikes because there's not really a lot of commercial or apartment buildings in the pipeline. But when they do happen, it's like a 400 unit building in downtown. So you're, gonna get, you're probably going to get this, this spike every once in a while. So I wouldn't read too much of this trend. This number, these two colors are probably not going to grow. They're probably going to shrink because of the land we're running out of. And this, this may pop up every once in a while. Okay. Is that fiscal or calendar year? This is calendar year. Okay. So that's through the end of 2019. This is, uh, again, the same time periods as shown, but it's a breakout of unit type. And this is just to point out that or the, the changing unit type is occurring. So as Howard County, um, the typical Greenfield development where you have single detached neighborhoods and townhouses, there's less of that. So we're going to have more apartments and condos like in downtown Columbia and along the Route 1 corridor. Um, so that this trend is going to continue. Or we're going to have mostly multifamily units moving forward. And the next general plan will really establish how we want to do this moving forward. Do we want to read it on the gateway, for example, and put mixed use multifamily at all? So there's, there's a lot of policy questions coming forward in the future. So what this tries to do, this is interesting because it sort of kind of is, is I question what's happening, and we don't really know because of the fact that we've just said recently that there's more uh, households that are single person households because we're building more apartments. That's happening, but we're also the, the population, the average persons per household is increasing in Howard County, which is a turnaround of like a four decade, five decade trend. So since post-World War II, if you look at each uh, decennial census, the average person per household, really nationwide, but in Howard County also, has been decreasing. And it stayed about the same between 2000 and 2010, but it's increasing, it's starting to increase. And this comes from ACS data, so the question is how accurate is that? There is a margin of error. So when the 2020 census data comes out, we'll really get a, a good idea of, is the pot average persons per household increasing? Really haven't increased that much for single family um, uh, detached or owner occupied units, but for rental, it's about a 6.4% increase. So if you think of all the rental units in the county, um, which is, um, I think there's 120,000 units in the county, and the rental is, like 30 or 40,000, there might be a slide on that. If you have a 6.4% a, a increase in that, in all those thousands of units, you're going to add people and students from existing. <coughs> do, you have, do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. are, are the new apartment buildings changing the bedroom count per unit in the rental market? So it depends where it is. In, in the new, most of the apartments we're building now are in downtown Columbia. Um, there's a lot more studios and one bedrooms and less two bedrooms and three bedrooms compared to the existing apartments. When you think of like garden apartments, kind of like the three or four story apartments that are you know different parts of the county, those typically have a higher mix of two and three bedroom units compared to the, the new types of apartments that are being built in downtown Columbia. So I, I, just to chime in, so as an example, just to even put a face to it, the new apartments that are being built over in Elkridge, as an example, um, particularly the ones that are over by Thomas Vida mm -hmm. and Coca-Cola Drive, those have a lot of like two and three bedroom um, right. and you know units, as well as I think the ones that are also being built 
right there on Daniel Legum, not Daniel Legum, but uh, I think it's something Legum, but right there, Route 1, across by the cemetery. Um, and so those will have more two and three, just, in, just so you have a visual in comparison to what Jeff is talking about with Columbia. And, and Lexley and... Right, yeah, that, so that's the one, that's on 104? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. 104. Yeah. So I don't know the unit mix on that, but that would be good to, to, to look into. But yeah. So there is a, how it's changing to the basics, I don't, I don't know what the different dynamics are, for sure. Um, so uh, this, this is new housing units now. So we have about 120,000 homes currently in the county. This is our, our you know, projected build out based again on the general plan that was adopted about 10 years ago. So that, this may change. Um, so based on, this is based on our current capacity, uh, based on zoning, and also based on this redevelopment potential, because we do, we, we have been entering into this redevelopment sort of phase the last five years, really since the last general plan, it's going to become accelerated moving forward. So a lot of this includes um, our expectations back then of the potential for Route 1, for example, to be developed. So we changed the zoning to allow that, but to the extent that it does or does not happen, our capacity may not be as much. We do know, though, we have about um, 7,000 housing units in the process. So that's subdivision plans that EPZ is reviewing. Those are going to be built um, over the next you know, 10 years um, or so. So we do have a lot, um, a fair amount in the, in the pipeline. I do have a slide at the end that shows a good <coughs> indicator of what's happening post EPCO, which is a really interesting um, piece of information. Just to your question, Richard, about how to how to build in the forecast, given sort of this change that has occurred. So um, that's where we stand with that. And then this really shows the difference between the unit type. So right now we have about half of the units are single family detached, which is pretty unique, really, for a suburban jurisdiction. We have a lot of housing diversity in Howard County. We do have a lot of townhouses <coughs> and apartments, particularly given the District of Columbia and all the village centers. Um, and it's expected to become more diverse, where the future, at least based on our current zoning situation, you know, half, more than half of the future units are going to be an apartment units, mostly rental probably, and, and some condo as well. This is really intended, and the kind of, the slide kind of translated strangely, but um, this, this really is show planning areas. So this is the upgrade planning area. This is Columbia planning area. The southeast planning area is here. Um, Elegant City planning area is up there. And then the rural west is everything west of what's called the plan service area boundary. It's called the rural west because there's no water or sewer, uh, public water or sewer. West of that, so it's very low density development with a lot of preservation, a lot of land preservation. So this is, the blue is the existing units and the colors on top are the projected growth. So you can see most of the future growth will be in, in Columbia. And that's that's uh, downtown Columbia, really. It does include some potential village center redevelopment. Uh, Long Beach, for example, could be redeveloped for Harper's, Harper's Choice. Uh, Wild Lake already was recently. They had the 215 house units, for example. So again, that's based on the current situation. And the next general plan will provide an opportunity to kind of relook at all this. This is just the top part, showing the number of units adding up to that kind of capacity that we have now by planning area. So this is a, a pie chart of all the land in Howard County. And 36% um, is residential, 16% is commercial and industrial, um, and um, utility right of ways and things like that. And we have about 8.6% of the land is, is undeveloped, which includes land in the rural west, that is farmland that could either become preserved or it could become uh, developed with single family detached homes. There's not much of that left, but that, that number includes that. The rural west includes about 60% of the land area of the county. Kind of added, added to that. And the county's preserved about 39%. So the county has done a really good job um, of, of having in its policies of preserving land in the rural west as well as in the east. And that includes um, preservation easements, like agricultural preservation easements and other environmental preservation easements, Howard County Conservancy easements. And it includes um, open space and park land, which is basically land that Howard County Parks um, owns. 
contains, including passive parkland, like the uh, construction um, environmental area, as well as active parks like some Centennial, uh, Centennial Lake, and so you kind of see a picture of how we're going to land use. So this future here, in terms of land use, there's really not much to work with um, in terms of future growth, and so the county has an opportunity to, to look at the redevelopment potential. Jeff, one, one quick thing, yeah. if you can go back. That the eight and a half percent or so undeveloped land, that includes the undeveloped land in the rural west. Yes. So, so how much of that developable land is in the service area? Um, probably, um, I don't know the percentage, but it's less than half of that. Or, or probably could be a board percent. Yeah. Because most of the, the, this is acres, this is based on acres. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there's not much left so in it's, the east. Yeah, it's yeah. 6,000 acres. Right, could be something like In the that. service area. Yeah, yeah. There's not much, right? This was very complicated and I had it set up so like one of the little one of the items would come in at a time to try to explain it. But the point of this is that um, in, in 1994, this was the situation. And we picked 1994 because that was when the Ag Pres program kicked in. And that's when the, the 1990 plan set the policy of creating an agricultural preservation program. So at that time, about 38% of the land was undeveloped in Howard County. And you can see you know, how much was residential and commercial compared to uh, open space parkland and preserved easements. If you jump up to the current, 2019, we have this 13,000 acres of undeveloped left. During that time, so it's 9% of land undeveloped. During that time, to, to cut in what was developed, what was changed in this um, red, 21,000 of that became um, residential or commercial. So it turned into houses and buildings and businesses. And 25,000 of it was preserved through parks, easements, and parkland. So this is really just to point out the county's done a really good job in terms of um, preservation. And that was the policy set in the, in the uh, 1990s general plan. This is to say we have a land use map, so um, it's online. So it's, we try to set it up so you can go online and you can dig down into it and look at all the other Get Getting to your question, the light yellow, it's a, it's a lot to, in this map, but if you go online, you can kind of see better. The light yellow is the undeveloped uh, portions of the county. And the light um, other colors, commercial, like the light sort of red, the light purple, light blue, those are the undeveloped um, commercial areas. So a lot of the light yellow, getting to your question, is, um, is, is, you can see these big acreages, right? So they take a lot of that 13,000 acres in the Midwest. Okay, so talk a bit about, about, about APFO. Um, so the, some changes occurred. It was effective July 2019. The last county council adopted the law um, and they, they uh, delayed the provision to occur. One of the major provisions occurred in July of 2019, which took effect. And it adds a high school test and it lowers the rates from elementary from 115% when the schools overutilized to 105%. Um, it lowers the rate from middle school from 115 to 110. And it added a high school test. Um, and there are some other changes included. This is the impact of that. So the colored areas are, the, are the, the closed schools in terms of new development can't occur in those areas. Um, the, the red is elementary closed schools. The kind of the blue horizontal is the closed middle school. And the, the dots are the closed high school. Let's say over that. So about 80% of the, the, eastern, the eastern part of the county is now held up due to closed schools per APFO, effective July 2019. The way APFO works, projects can be held up for up to four years. So they retake the test every year, and then if the schools schools are not open, um, then they remain on hold. And that's what the fiscal impact tried to measure, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Jeff, um, yeah. after four years, though, the project moves forward, Correct. and that has been taking place for the last you know, a few years, the last 20 years or so, that has been taking place. So if, if a school is closed mm -hmm. and the project is tested 
every year for four years, right. and the project moves forward after that. So that has been taking place, right? Yes, yeah, so that law, that provision has been in effect since that we began. Um, we looked at that recently. So the, the number of projects that have reached that four-year limit um, have been very few, quite frankly, until recent times, until the, probably two, three, four years ago. With the recent history of APFL, there have been more projects that have hit that four-year wave and have been gone forward. Is there a report that shows that? I think we presented that once. I could try to find something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the this committee um, asked that a fiscal study be done. I think last year, um, Urban Analytics came and they presented, but it wasn't done at this time of the year. It's finished in July. Um, was the was the final report ever presented? To, wasn't presented this group, but was presented to the County Council and, and to, you know it was publicly presented. So I'm going to give a kind of a quick summary of, of that. Um, you've probably seen this before. But these are the, the, the residential projections that went into the fiscal study. So, so the general plan projection is the plan Howard 2030. That's the estimated new number of housing units per year um, to the end of the plan period, which is here, and then we sort of extrapolate in the next 10 years to 2040. So you can see the natural um, part of growth is slowing. So this, we are experiencing a, a downturn in growth uh, given capacity. What the new APFO did, they kicked in this growth to happen quicker. So the estimate is that beginning around 2022, when everything that's in the pipeline is sort of moved through the process, because it's a three-year process, plans are tested when they first come in, and then it takes about three years to review the plans, and then get the building permits, and then build the houses, and occupy the housing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a long year process. <coughs> that's why, even though APFO was in effect in 2019, um, we're not going to see the effect most likely until two, three years down the road. And this is an estimate of, of what we think is going to happen. You get that four-year wait. And then um, this really sort of is optimistic because it assumes that developers are going to want to enter into the, the, the pipeline and then wait four years. And then they'll come out slowly. Um, what we're finding, and I'll show this at, at the end, we're, we have some leading indicators that this isn't happening. It seems like uh, development is not being coming in the pipeline at all for very small analysis. I don't want to say that absolutely because it's been only six months, but it could be that this is optimistic, um, which means the result of the fiscal study could be a little bit more optimistic than what happened. So the fiscal study looked at all these things. It looked at all the tax revenues. It looked at the general fund. Um, it looked at property taxes and income taxes from a marginal basis, meaning that it looked at we tried to evaluate the property values in the different areas of the county and apply that for new, new construction and existing homes. Um, same with income tax. And the, the study itself, which I believe will be in the Dropbox, has all these details of how, how it was calculated. Um, okay, I'll double-check and make sure. If it's not in the Dropbox, okay. I'll make sure to put it into the okay. It used to be online. It's no longer online. I don't think it's online. Okay, we'll make sure. Okay. Right. Uh, transfer tax and record tax. And we also include these one-time fees. And these are important. Um, and that's one reason why, if development stops, it might be fiscally difficult for the county because um, when a new house is built, there's a lot of school surcharge revenues that come into the county and building excise tax, which is really meant to pay for new roads. So there was anticipation that these revenues were going to continue to come in to pay off the debt service that have already been issued. If those sort of slow down too quickly and they don't come in as projected, then the county still has to pay the debt, and they would conceivably use general general revenue to pay for those, which means there's less general revenue to pay for other things, but general obligation on debt. So it is a challenge. If, depending on what happens in the future, this could be a fiscal challenge. Yes. So in uh, this particular uh, study, I, I looked at it. Um, I looked at it very carefully, and uh, I had a couple of questions about. Um, the models. The model is used to predict future revenue for the the, the next de decade or so, uh, but it, it did not show that it can predict existing fiscal state. So it's sort of like benchmarking. The, I, I didn't see a benchmarking of the model to show existing state. Um, and then the other thing was that uh, it took. Uh, it mentioned that it took an out outlier, uh, um, which was you know over 100 million dollars in, in cost to due to the Ellicott City 
flooding. Um, and um, the, uh, the other thing that I, that I didn't see was that it didn't take into account um, potential redistricting that could take place. Um, so did, did the county or did anyone follow up and ask why that did not take place to, uh, uh, in, in the analysis? Uh, because if you know the absence of those <coughs> does not provide confidence that the result um, is uh, defensible. Right. Well, since you very quickly, because we don't have all that much time on the on the, the benchmark, I don't know if I fully understand your question, but um, the fiscal study in general is based on current levels of service. So the benchmark would be how much do we pay per person for police, for example. That was sort of the benchmark. So that's that's how it's based, based on current level of service. It's not based on um, and ex what we want to happen. It's based on current levels of service and the tries to protect that forward. Let, uh, let me be clear on uh, when I say the benchmark, it's to input um, data from the last, let's say, 10 or 20 years, mm -hmm. because the, the data that was that that's been used to input for the to predict the future. We, we, you know, that data is available for the last 20 years. So, um, if you're if, if you're using the model, you would input them those that data for the last 20 years to predict or to demonstrate that it's capable of predicting existing state, which is that's what right. that's the activity of benchmarking. Right. So, right? so, so, so that hasn't, that wasn't trend. done. Well, that's a trends analysis, which is a little bit different. And if my sense is, if you were to do that, if, if the fiscal bills would end up worse. We could talk afterwards, just because it's a yeah, can debate yeah, for Jeff, real yeah. quickly, that, that doesn't include the increase in school surcharge? It does not. So, so that's two things. And getting back to your question about redistricting, it did not include redistricting, because we, it was, we, were, we didn't know what would happen. Now, redistricting has happened, and so that could help. And the other thing is that the school surcharge increase, that could help. Because my very last slide kind of talks about that. But yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so here's the costs. We, we looked at operating and uh, capital or debt service costs. Um, we tried to cover alternate fund revenues and alternate fund costs moving forward. And basically, you know, the, the, the takeaway is that and this is oftentimes not um, agreed to or believed that new growth pays for itself. So basically, since new residential development is fiscally positive to the county, so new housing unit actually generates more in revenues. And it does in expenditures. And that's detailed in the study. And there's been other festivals done all over Maryland, and that's been uh, done the same thing. They, they've said the same thing. And one of the main reasons for that is because in Howard County, you have a local income tax and a local property tax. So residents contribute a lot to the 90% of our income tax and, and property tax. So residential units contribute a lot in terms of land use, a lot to the county tax base. There are a lot of expenses to schools and things, but the amount of revenue that is created, and that frequently asked questions tries to tries to indicate why, because it's, it tries to communicate that. So I really suggest you read that. Um, and non-residential also is fiscally positive to the county. And the tax structure is important because in some other places, it's it's different. Like in Maryland, it's sales tax, so it's not necessarily directly linked to revenues or not as much in trouble of needing to move along or new population coming in because sales tax can be uh, just right. by anybody. But here it's very directly, a lot of the major county revenue are directly tied to houses and the population growth on that. It's income tax, it's property tax, it's school surcharge, building fee, transfer and everything. So a lot of it is directly related. In a lot of other places not in Maryland, it's not necessarily yeah. the case on that. It could be tourists and a lot of that. So that's very different to structure. Prior to me, when I was working at a, as a fiscal consultant before coming here, so we did a fiscal impact in Arizona. And in Arizona, 60 per, like 40 percent of the local revenues come from the local sales tax. So they need retail. And housing does not pay for itself mm -hmm. in Maricopa County, Arizona. There was a retail big mall that was planned, and they were going to put the mall in an Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. People were really upset about that because then all that sales tax when it comes to the, you know, so you had that kind of competition happening there. In Dublin, Ohio, outside of Columbus, they have a local income tax, but it's based on place of work. So they need office. 
So if you build an office in Dublin, Ohio, the people that work there, they pay a local income tax to the city of Dublin to pay some place to work. So offices in Howard County, people pay local income tax where you live. And I don't think local income tax is very common. I think like Tennessee might have, the, the counties in Tennessee. It's not, it's not common at all, it's very unique. So Howard County, so you hear people say, if residential doesn't pay in, in, other, in other studies around the country, that's true, maybe, probably. Um, but you've got to look at the local tax structure. And, and in Maryland counties, the local tax structure is such that, particularly with these one-time fees like road excise tax and school surcharge, that brings in $20,000, $30,000 per house, which every time a house is up. Yes, sir. And one reason for that is that the average person moving in, because of the appreciation in the value of housing in Howard County, be it rental, be it uh, homeowner, um, because that has appreciated so much, the new people moving in have higher incomes than the people who live here, generally speaking. So as a result, you're bringing in people with higher incomes than the resident base. And that's also in the, in the FAQ. So I'm just pointing out, because, you didn't yeah, mention it, I wanted to make that's sure. That's a very good point, yeah, right. Um, in fact, and, and um, Richard was a co-author of this book report in, in the FAQ as well. Um, so, um, one of the challenges is the, this, the fact that we've had growth in the county every year since the modern day of the county, since the 60s, right? So it's sort of like the conveyor belt. So better or for worse, making no judgment whether this growth is good or bad, it's just the way it is. It's kind of what like Larry said. So we have built into the fiscal structure these one-time fees. If that stops or slows down, or if it slows down earlier and sharper than we anticipated, that's going to cause fiscal problems. It's just kind of, you know, with completely agnostic, what is growth good or bad, we have this sort of structure that's built into the structure of the county. That's really what this study shows. So this is, I'm almost done. This is the leading indicator that I was talking about. So every project in Howard County has to have what's called a pre submission community meeting. So any time a developer wants to put some houses on their land or commercial on their land, that the commercial is also now required to have pre submission community they come to us, they apply for it, they get a sign, they post the sign on the property, they put it on our website, they hold a meeting, um, with, with, they invite the, the neighbors and they invite everyone in an email list that people can sign up to. They have this public meeting and they say, I'm going to build 20 houses. So we know when those meetings come forward, then they have up to a year to then submit a subdivision plan to DBZ, or they may not submit a subdivision plan. But that, that's, so it's a, it's a good leading indicator and so what we did, we've noticed that these numbers of pre-submission meetings are way down. So we did this analysis. So uh, this is the first and second means first six months of the year and the second six months of the year since 2010. So on average, there's about there's been about 23 pre-submission community meetings every six months. And then since Apple was effective, we had seven. So the, the number of pre-submission communities and residential has gone down. And then in terms of units, we averaged about um, 752 units, meaning that the, the, people, the developers said we're going to build 10 units here, 15 units here. We add up all those those units that they're holding these meetings for about 750 every six months, which makes sense because the county builds about 1,500 units a year. And the last six months, there's been um, pre-submission community meetings of 38 units. Looking through February uh, 19th, because you have to have three weeks advance notice. So from January to February. We've had two more pre-submission meetings come in with a total of nine units. So this is just, you know, this is a question. We actually had another one, the Dorsey Overlook with 81 units also in addition to that. Um, however, that was included in the past numbers because that plan came in before Boyd announced coming in again. But it, it has come in again. Yes. Um, so Jeff, um, I uh, maybe it's just me, uh, but I don't believe that the, the study adequately demonstrated that it can predict future fiscal impacts because there was, uh, what you mentioned is a trend, trend line, our trending analysis is completely different from benchmarking. When you, when you benchmark, you demonstrate that you're capable of produ reproducing something, and that was not done. Um, but so that's the you know that was that's one thing. The other thing was school surcharge fees for the last 20 years have been like 2,000 or 3,000 dollars per home on average. 
um, the you know the uh, residential um, the growth mitigation standards have been very low as well for the last um, 20 years, um, and almost I would say 60% uh, of growth. For, if you pick schools, for example, uh, almost 60% of growth annual growth into the school system has been due to a new residential development. I think the school providers different the number. Yeah. Yeah. The past yeah. always says six percent from existing sales. Right. I already yeah. sent yeah. an email to ask for confirmation. I haven't heard back yet. But Dr. Dr. Sun, yeah. they yeah. always say six percent from existing sales. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's uh, the number, the forty percent, <coughs> and I'm happy to to to. It was actually provided by the county. The forty percent number. Uh, is uh, um, <coughs> I'm happy to provide the, the the data that was provided by. Can the we county. ask the school next time to provide us? Okay. So the question. Thank you. Uh, clarify all the percentage. Okay. So right. the question is, given <coughs> these are these are the issues, is is it the, is it the position of the county that residential development pays for itself, even though it has been demonstrated that the conclusions of the study uh, cannot be taken, given the, the flaws of the study, given the school surcharge fees being low for the last few 20 years. Excuse me. I, I think that if you want to have a technical discussion, we probably need, need more time. And if you I mean, believe the consultant study has flaws here, we can find time to separate discuss about that. And you need to have evidence rather than I don't believe or not. I think you need to have strong evidence to show and technical because consultant was was picked up through competitive bid and was very valid, I think, uh, yeah. methodology. If there's a technical detail, there's confusion that I think we can organize separate meeting and whoever else interested, we can do that as well there. But I think if you just say, I don't believe it, it doesn't seem to make sense there, I think it's not sufficient to, to either say yes or no and waste very limited time on that. So I would say, hold on that, let's do an offset. We try to pull out a separate discussion if needed on that there. But again, this is evidence-based discussion. And uh, I think that for anybody, and there's more than one economist, a uh, land developer uh, in those uh, consultant study, if there's any counter argument, we will be happy to hear about that yeah. here and want to sit down together, get a chance to look at that. But we need the evidence and the numbers behind it before we can say, yes, that makes sense or not. On that. And we'll be happy to do that, but not to use this occasion. By the way, I do want to give a little bit of time while our Chamber of Commerce and Leonardo has been waiting very patiently on that. Okay. Good. Thank you. And so this whole thing leads into the, this is the topic of balance. So you need all these things, and, and these things have been happening. School surcharge was raised, redistricting occurred, AFLA was strengthened. The question is, are you finding the right balance? Are you strengthening AFLA too much so that the units don't come in so that they can't pay for the new school charge? So it's all about balancing things out. Very difficult. Yeah, that's what the challenge is. One quick question regarding the study. Do you feel that the study adequately accounted for the fact that there isn't existing capacity now and capacity issues? Because it seems as though a lot of the talk when we talk about AFCO, we're doing it as though we're looking to prevent future issues. But we are already, for lack of a better term, in the hole right now. So it's almost as though we're having two different discussions. That's a very good point. The, the, the fiscal study assumed the capacity to be there. It just was about money, right? We assumed there was land in schools. That just, but that, so the next general plan, that's going to be a very important part of the general plan. And we're going to work very closely with the school system to include concept of where are we going to put these new schools and how much are we going to charge. So that, that's, a, that's a very important We're thing. looking forward to that and also yeah. the fact that your planning regions and our planning regions aren't even on the same plan. Mm -hmm. right. So that's the other problem. Yeah. We're basically speaking two totally different languages and we need yeah. So Apple will change for sure. Yeah. So just a quick question. Uh, earlier in your slides you showed that you're uh, expecting a large percentage of the room in the Columbia area. So what are you saying as far as Is there, is there a change? Yeah, so Columbia is actually happening slower than we thought. It's, a, it's been, always been a 30 year plan, but <clears throat> it's, it's coming in. You can see it, but it's taking a long time. So, yeah, it is slow. It is slow. Yeah. So, it's been a long morning, and everybody's been sitting for a long time. And so, uh, 
I'm going to go through this um, relatively quickly. You all have a copy of both the survey as well as also this in your um, package that you can take a look at. And ultimately, I'll just say, kind of just summing it up, I think in many respects it's been actually interesting to do this last and, and hearing all of the presentations, both from an economic development perspective, also from a, a planning standpoint, the, uh, the economic analysis, and, and ultimately that's been all more what I would say quantitative in the sense that it's certainly been very research model driven. This was more so going to be on the qualitative side in the sense of at the end of the day, what are businesses feeling, and so that ultimately as we continue to have this discussion, we have, and I touched on this I think on one of the slides where I say it's all about balance, and I think Jeff's presentation ended it well. And so just quickly um, about this, we've typically done a uh, economic or business climate survey. Normally we've done it in the past. Uh, well, let me say it differently. We've normally done it end of the year prior to having um, um, Anubhan Basu come and give our, speak at our economic forecast breakfast. This year, we delayed it specifically. We also did it where we look back uh, on some of the answers back to 2018. Again, getting a sense of, you know, what do you feel? Are you adding jobs, decreasing jobs? What are barriers? <coughs> what are challenges for you, et cetera? Quickly, for those of you that are still new to understanding what a chamber does, just a quick uh, synopsis, we, um, like to sum up everything we do into the uh, categories of people, policy, and prosperity. People, meaning in the sense of both development, whether that's professionally, through our conferences, seminars, et cetera, or the networking from a business development, et cetera. The policy, um, this certainly ties into it, but that's the work that we do in some cases from an anal analyzation, testifying both in for or against certain policies, both here locally as well as in Annapolis, the prosperity piece ties into the work that we do in support of our community partners, uh, namely economic development, tourism, leadership, Power County, and countless others that are here in the room and not in the room. So the survey we ultimately did with uh, two things. Uh, one, looking at, again, trying to get a sense of business confidence in Howard County. Secondly, also to be able to provide some additional input here so that as we make our recommendations, Again, as it's touched on, we have hopefully some balance in terms of as we contemplate various recommend, recommendations. Balance from the perspective of you've got the residential point of view, you've got the institutional. In our case, we define institutional from whether that's government, our higher education institutions, even from a K-12, but those entities, and then obviously from the employee perspective. You'll hear me oftentimes use interchangeably business and employer. And again, from, from a chamber standpoint, we don't always separate and say, we look at nonprofits at the end of the day, that's, the nonprofit is a tax status, but yet they employ a lot of people here in Howard County. So when we say employers, that's kind of, we're taking into account everyone that actually has someone working for them or providing some form of service or what have you. So quickly, just so you have a sense of the sample, we were very intentional uh, this year. We ultimately had about 100 um, uh, survey participants. We wanted to make sure that they were ultimately people that could make decisions or that had a role in making decisions within their companies or organizations. Hence, they were all either at a minimum a director, management, department level person, or they might have been VP, senior level executive, part of the, again, the management team, or, as you can see here, largely in our case, they were the CEO, the partner, or the owner. So again, people that could actually make, that could speak to the decisions being made about their business organization. The other thing as well, we were also, um, we did not discriminate in the sense of who we sent the survey to. And so, for instance, um, we had everyone from government contractors to not-for-profits to uh, accountants, CPAs, development, construction, Etc. I think I'll touch on that. It may be in one of the, the different slides. The other thing you'll see is that I think these numbers are also relatively consistent with also the employment counts here in Howard County. I think you probably would have seen it earlier in the EDA presentation um, in terms of how both ultimately about what 75, 80 percent of the businesses in Howard County have basically 20, 25 employees or less. And so, in our case, we probably, even on the top end, skewed a little bit higher, interestingly enough, on the more than 201, 
but you at least get a sense of it covers a big cross-section in terms of who participated and how big their organizations are. So just some of the quick results um, in terms of we asked a question regarding job expansion or loss, and this was sent, and it says in January, but it should be since January of 2018, uh, trying to go back about uh, two years. So ultimately we've seen here 46% increase in jobs, 11% um, decrease with about, again, 43% that was generally about the same. Um, what was interesting, and again, I think this speaks to the size of the companies participating, in a sense of those that increased jobs, the vast majority did so in the 1 to 20 category arena. So again, I think that speaks to A, the size of the companies, but even I think that some of the other presentations that we've heard, in a sense of yes, businesses or organizations may be adding people, but they're not adding them necessarily in just waves, but it may be five, it may be 10, or what have you. Um, again, those that decreased, about 9% did so, again, in that one to 20 um, category range. And for those that decreased, it was largely on the accounts of either mergers and acquisitions, uh, maybe it was to be closer to another, uh, to clients, um, least uh, uh, ended, it may have been just also cost of doing business where they found it maybe less expensive to do business other places. Um, you can also see here in terms of the jobs that were full-time, part-time, what have you. Um, just some of the other reasons why companies ultimately that added jobs, why they did so. Um, first being proximity to customers. I think these, these uh, three here are certainly, if you think about the area, is no uh, surprise. Proximity to customers. Again, we talked about where we sit being, again, not far from D.C., not far from uh, Baltimore City, and, and certainly the surrounding areas. Workforce, educated workforce. Um, but also seeing uh, the, the merge and acquisition of uh, M&A activity continues to be high, especially those on the uh, technology, government contracting, financial service realm. Um, interestingly enough, we had about 60 of the 100 to answer specifically this question. Each participant was asked to select three. In some cases, some might have actually answered all three. In other cases, it may only have answered two. And so, if you actually see the survey, you'll note that these numbers don't actually fully add up to 100%. Also, when we ask the question about why they left, again, streamlining cost, which a lot of times could be tied to the merger and acquisition side of things. Also, lower land infrastructure costs and less regulation. Those two were actually tied at 15%. So again, I think on the regulation side, certainly getting into some of the policy decisions. And then also, interestingly enough, again, proximity to customers. Um, again, you can see a low, uh, because again, the number of folks early on that said they were decreasing, hence the reason there wasn't a lot, again, of, of answers to that specific question. Just uh, moving through, um, these are also some uh, opinions. We asked two specific questions that were closely related. One was, how are you, uh, how is your industry growing? But then more specifically, how are you doing yourself? So as an example, you may be in an industry that perhaps is on the decline or not doing as well, but your business itself may not reflect how the industry itself is doing. So in this case, we're for the most part all about the same in that, again, 42% felt strongly about, again, uh, job growth. 39% uh, ultimately saw no change with about 16%, you know, fairing uh, worse. Next was dealing with ultimately strengths and weaknesses of doing business in the county. And so I think, again, some of these things, particularly on the business challenges, I think speak to, again, things that we've heard here, as well as also other challenges that we've talked about, whether in this group or other committees or task forces within the county. So as an example, the benefits of strengths, again, proximity to customers and competitors. Again, we've talked about that, Larry's talked about that, we kind of know where we sit in the region, et cetera. Proximity to markets, similar thing. You can actually get goods and services, again, to various places all within, let's just say, an hour, two hour um, range. Uh, number three was tied access to skilled labor plus the entrepreneurial mindset. 
And again, I, I think that speaks again both to the innovation that's being talked about and focused on from a um, innovation center, but also the fact that I've heard countless, countless, said countless times within um, meetings that I'm in that hey, there's a feeling that if you can't succeed in Howard County, then you know, why, you know, where can you succeed? That just this environment alone, with the number of small business owners, et cetera, leads to that ecosystem of success or of ability to to do well. But again, I think on the challenges. Top five, again, and this was interesting here, that it wasn't so much a not-for-profit answer, uh, what it was across the board, that 71% ranked um, high housing costs for employees. So again, I think that gets into a housing affordability. Obviously, later on, um, you know, we've got already a, a affordable housing task force that's gonna be working on uh, a master plan. But I think more so for this group, it speaks to, as we talk about, as an example, do we recommend, which we've done in the past, of increasing recordation fees or the transfer tax, what does that also do, again, getting back to that housing affordability piece, um, being that so many of our employers are talking about that as a barrier for you know, their workers, also as we look at transportation, and if they're driving an hour to get to where they work, what is that doing for our infrastructure as well? Um, number two was uh, employee recruitment and retention costs. Again, the ability to hire people, but for our contractors, constantly almost being in a bidding game to where, you know, it's, if, I joke and say, if you drive around Gateway, you would almost, think the same way you see residential homes signs up in certain parts of the county, in Gateway you're seeing we're hiring signs. And it just speaks again to the challenges on the tech side as well that you're seeing from a talent, both retention, I mean recruitment and retention side. Four, transportation and infrastructure. And then the last two, uh, labor costs. Once you get them in, you know, the, the cost, of, and, and this really I think could speak, in some respects it could speak to Howard County, but maybe be a bigger issue in terms of just doing business in the state. And then also taxes. Um, I think I have maybe just a couple more slides. In terms of cost of living challenges, because I think again this is ties back to those things that we have to think about in this group. Um, again, big top two here, housing costs, taxes. I think he's already talked about, we're already in the, the upper end on the tax spectrum already. So as we have to think about decisions that we have to make here, again, is taxes something that really is, is that on the table? Um, I thought this last question was interesting, the top three things that local government can do to improve the business climate. One was reduction in fees and taxes, <laughs> no surprise. Um, improve transportation and infrastructure, approve more affordable housing. So you can see the connection there. Um, the other two things that still have somewhat of a development or infrastructure related, a related piece is ease local road congestion and streamline the permit approval process. So quickly, um, Last question we asked was overall, what was your opinion on the direction of the county from a regulatory perspective? Again, if you remember going back now, some two hours ago, when Larry was talking and we were talking about, again, public perception and how do people feel about doing business in the county. Forget about whether it's you know, uh, certain policies in place, you agree or disagree, but what's the feeling? And so what was interesting here was how it was relatively balanced across the, the spectrum and but yet at the same time you can really see it's a it's a mix and the way we actually phrased the question and so I had to go in and kind of interject and put kind of what those things may have meant we asked it from a standpoint of one meaning everything is great to five meaning absolutely wrong and so they had that but so I had to then go back and look at the numbers and I just kind of guessed and said, okay, right direction is to the, was the one, wrong direction would be the five, and kind of the thinking that may have been in place for if you gave it a two, three, or four. But what was interesting was you had 16% that didn't answer those that they just elected to actually write their responses. And so, um, which on the don't know, don't answer, I can just tell you those were not favorable responses. And so, key takeaways, 
generally, the respondent, most respondents, you know, again, are doing well, um, which I think could be ultimately a combination of things in terms of their feelings on the county. It could be the economy, which, excuse me, which we're seeing overall, and which we've heard presentation on, presentations on, just Howard County in general, uh, just, enjoy, just, I guess, enjoying or liking being here. Also, business strength. When I say business strength, meaning just maybe it's how long they've been in business themselves, their place in the market. But the, what was interesting when you looked at the breakdown of those completing the survey and perceptions of feelings, those in non-development business had a more favorable view of the business climate than those in development-related industries, i.e., construction, development, building, engineering, et cetera. If you were in that segment, which was probably out of the 100, which was anywhere about 17 to 20% of the participants, maybe 15, somewhere thereabouts, again, totally different view in terms of the direction and in terms of what they're feeling as it relates to Howard County as a place to do business. Um, I think community issues are certainly starting to impact employers, i.e., housing affordability and transportation access. And then, you know, I think there was another piece that there wasn't, I think, necessarily a clear consensus in terms of direction, which in, in some respects, I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, if you add, if you just take the first two and add them up, if you take the last two and add them up, you could almost try to weight it that way. But you end up seeing almost literally a third, third, and a third. And then it's where you get to some of, and so that's one I think in many respects to watch. Just because as we think about, again, perception, real or otherwise, if people perceive that the county perhaps is a place that's either becoming difficult to do business, that's not um, attentive to business needs, real or otherwise, it's hard to a lot of times overcome those perceptions. So that uh, sums it up here. And, and, thank you so much. And I won't worry about questions because we're already four minutes over. Thank you so much. Again, very um, informative session. I'm sorry it's a little bit longer because I there are so much good things to offer the folks in. Um, hopefully give you food for thought. Next meeting is going to be really important. It's on February 7th, and that's the meeting to solve all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> but serious, next the meeting actually is going to be long. We have to hold uh, three hours um, because we want to talk about actually, trying to talk about conclusion or recommendation from this committee. So it's going to be about revenue projection, debt projection, multi-year projection, and also what kind of recommendations the committee as a whole wants to put together. So thank you very much, and especially thank all the speakers.